Okay, microphone's on. But don't, do you hear anything? Thank you for joining us for the Board of Commissioners meeting here in Deschutes County, 9 a.m. Wednesday, February 1st, 2023. First item on the agenda is Pledge of Allegiance, if you'd please join me. So uh, next item is citizen input on topics that are not on the agenda today. So uh, first one is Doralee King and about uh, co-housing. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, this is a three minute testimony for items not on the agenda. Hi, Patty. Hello, good morning. Um, anyway, I am here for a project that I've been working on for since 2010, I think, actually. and. Uh, Commissioner DeBone requests that I come today and represent. What it amounts to is a project for community living in the Deschutes County, which would not be co housing but living in individual uh, homes in a close proximity to support, you know, uh, security, friendship, uh, helping out, and uh, and just the various things that a good community, we do need more community in this country. It would be uh, on MUA land, and that is a project we've been working on with the state legislature approval for at least maybe a trial project. Um, it would uh, be maintain agriculture as much as you can on MUA land for like animals and grazing and that type of stuff where the house is kind of clustered. Uh, the, um, Go ahead and pull the microphone a little closer to you. It picks up pretty well. The um, age, well, it can be separate age groups, seniors, et cetera, or multi-age groups. It, uh, my focus is more on seniors since I'm there. And, uh, there is a need for seniors to have a more community supportive uh, environment both for uh, prevent loneliness which can lead to dementia which can lead to care in a fed uh, state or federal uh, facility uh, which adds up the cost uh, but it is beneficial to all age groups it would be a two acre um, minimum in the MUA land a requirement of uh, someone to own and the home ratio would be a pro one to one home to one acre but grouped not everybody would want an acre um, you would, the person would own their footprint which would be a house and a small yard and the rest of the land in its entirety I definitely uh, would do not want commercial development. This is more of a community type development. The owner of the land would live on the land, uh, not someone coming in and building and then leaving. So uh, that is what I'm trying to promote. Uh, it's like say it's been quite a while, but our main thing is to get enough support and to have the uh, state legislature agree to a trial project because MUA is 10 multiple use agriculture is a minimum of 10 acres but this would still maintain agricultural for what it is uh, grazing animals and that kind of stuff with the homes grouped in little pods so to speak and well, thank go ahead. You. yeah thank you very much uh, you know we are having legislative discussions right now uh, as I say, uh, Representative Levy is the right. one that uh, you, you know, I mentioned, just maybe contact our office, which I know you've tried to. I did. Uh, we're going to have a legislative update tomorrow. We'll be talking to a few folks there. So as I say, it's an idea that uh, I know you've been advocating for many years. So let's see if we can get a legislator engaged in this. Oh, well, let's see if it works. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your service, too. Um, I know I tried to get Senator Canope engaged in this project and then Representative Zika last year, but it was yeah, short right. session. You've been a lot of help. 
And um, I feel really badly because you have a vision and what you're saying really does make sense in our world, bringing people together and yet giving that rural setting, which um, right. is so important. So thank you. Thanks you're for your welcome. service. And Phil, I haven't talked, well, I don't know you very well, but if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. Hi, Nick. I responded a little bit by email. Okay. But um, I, I guess um, the one thing I would ask you to consider. As what? As one thing I would ask you to consider as you're pursuing this proposal is <coughs> if we did this on MUA land, 10 land all over the county, what would that look like? And so well, setting a precedent is, is very complicated. In yeah, that's why I was uh, saying that they, you need to have no commercial, you need to write up the bill that would promote this for the owner to live and maintain life on the property and would not be you know, it would be only for a specific group of people, not for some developer to come in and do it. Yeah. And that no, would be I, the I, main I, thing you'd have to avoid. You're correct. But you, even with that, I mean, just a, 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 like a higher density of rural residential development in an MUA property, if, if we had that, <coughs> if there was a precedent set and then we had it all over the county, and right. it would be very difficult to, to, to choose how to offer that to one property owner and not to offer it to other property owners. You know, there are, there are thousands of acres of MUA 10 uh, zoned land in the county. And if, if we were to kind of approve this right. to move forward and everybody who owns MUA 10 land wanted to do it, what would that what would the impacts be uh, to the county, to uh, other rural residential landowners? Right. I don't see too many uh, owners that want to live on the land in that situation. I mean, I may be wrong uh, because if you, it, the bill was written up in uh, Senate Bill 706 in 2019, and it uh, did have some, per, you know, definite rules with regards to any commercial development so you know I may be wrong on that but yeah I mean I'm I'm, I, I'm not talking about commercial development I'm just talking about higher densities of it would be a higher density in some in those who choose to do it in the rural unincorporated county and Correct. so that's that's well, the, rural residential yeah that that's the that's the issue yeah thank you okay thank you very much for your testimony take care uh, so is there a request to speak on any other item that's not on the agenda today? So I'll re ref uh, is there anybody online? Okay, there we, yes, we have somebody. So this is uh, public testimony, citizen input uh, online. There we go, Nadine. <coughs> Thank you for joining. There we go. Thank you. Please proceed, Nadine. I'm sorry, but I, I was invited. I wasn't prepared to, to talk. I just got a message to unmute myself. Okay. Yep, not a problem. So thank you for joining our meeting uh, via Zoom. So uh, other citizen input emails we've received is uh, asking for removal of specific parcels from consideration of landfill site, uh, specifically Bear Creek site. Also uh, inquiry about uh, bivalent booster for children under six, uh, six months to five years. So that's uh, been forwarded to our health department. I was able to engage in that one. Also, uh, five input emails about camping feasibility study RFP, which is uh, I want to thank the community for getting engaged on that. Some real good ideas are coming in uh, on that topic. Uh, so at this time, uh, I'll acknowledge we do have other, well, yeah, so we're going to get to the, the uh, public hearing in a moment. So consent agenda at this time. So move. Second. Any other discussion? Uh, seeing none, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And chair votes yes. I would like to say that um, you know, one of these consent agenda items <coughs> related to, to saving grace and providing resources to support their, their mission. And I'm hoping that as we are exploring uh, 
the expansion of the courthouse that Saving Grace is one of the entities that we are um, making sure that we offer space at in the in you know the the new shelled out third floor of the courthouse or other other areas that will be available. Great, thank you. So at this time, uh, public hearing. This is the time and place set for a hearing regarding file number 247-22678-MC and appeal numbers 247-22984-A and 247-23-3A. This is a hearing on the appeals of the Deschutes County Hearings Officer decision for a modification of the Thornburg Destination Resort's Fish and Wildlife Management Plan. Staff will outline the hearing procedures that will be followed. Thank you, Chairman Damone. For the record, um, can everyone hear me okay in the back? I know. Okay, thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Caroline House, and I'm a senior planner with the Deschutes County Planning Division. Um, as the chair just mentioned, today is a appeals hearing for the Board of County Commissioners to take testimony and receive written evidence concerning two appeals of a modification request to change the Thornburg Destination Resorts Fish and Wildlife Management Plan. Sorry, my slide went forward one. Mitigation plan, right? Sorry, is that, what did I, I say? Fish and Wildlife, you said Fish and Wildlife Management Plan. Sorry, yes, mitigation plan. Thank you for that correction. Um, if I can go back one slide, I don't, the keyboard's not working for me up here. But um, I guess I'll just start with going over that way the hearing will be conducted today. First, I'll explain how interested persons can testify. Then I'll provide a brief staff report. Then we'll begin the testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, the first um, person to provide testimony will be the applicant and their representatives followed by um, Ms. Gould, the other appellant in this case, and then agencies and government bodies. I have an asterisk on the slide here because I did receive a request from a representative with the uh, um, Confederate Tribes of Warm Springs. They have um, a tribal member here that has a family commitment that's gonna be starting I think around 10 or so, and they asked if uh, potentially they could go before Ms. Gould's team presents their testimony. I believe they've coordinated both with the applicant and um, Ms. Gould, but I did want to note that that request had been made. We'll look for nodding in the heads at this time. And yeah, okay, looks like we're good. Okay. okay, so a slight change on what's on the screen right now. So after the applicant, it will be agencies and government bodies. Then um, Ms. Gould's team will present their testimony. Then persons in support can present their testimony. And then persons in opposition. After that, the applicant will have a chance to provide rebuttal testimony, and then lastly, staff can provide closing comments. For um, anyone testifying today, just um, if it wasn't clear, it's a, a hybrid format with both in-person and remote participation allowed. Before you begin your testimony, please provide your first and last name, as well as your mailing address. Um, the board has established time limits for testimony. The applicant will have 30 minutes, the appellant's team will have 20 minutes. Agencies and government, government bodies will have 10 minutes. Other participants will have three, and the applicant will have 10 minutes for final rebuttal. For our in-person participants, please make sure you have filled out one of the blue sign-in sheets, which are over here on this table. Um, and this will be used by Chairman Demode to, to call up each participant um, for their testimony and make sure you come up to one of the microphones here at the table so your audio can be picked up before you start your, your testimony. If you're attending remotely, um, you'll need to be logged in using Zoom, and Chairman DeBone, when we get to the portion of the hearing for testimony, will ask everyone to use the raise hand feature to notify the board that you'd like to testify. If you're on a computer or smart device, you'll need to press the raise hand button. If you've called in, you'll need to dial star nine on your keypad. Again, that's press the raise hand button or star nine on your keypad. That's how we'll be able to know that you wanna testify. Um, in addition to testimony today, anyone can submit written testimony, please hand that to me if you're here in person. If you're attending remotely, please email that to me. Uh, my email is caroline.house at deschutes.org. Chairman DeBone and staff are responsible for a respectful and orderly hearing. Anyone acting inappropriately may be asked to leave. And um, at this time, Commissioner DeBone, I'm gonna shift back to the script 
and note that commissioners must disclose any ex parte contacts, prior hearing observations, biases, or conflicts of interest. So does any commissioner have anything to disclose? And if so, please state the nature of same and whether you can proceed. I have um, nothing to disclose. I can proceed. I have nothing to disclose and I can proceed. So other than being involved in uh, many steps of this hearing in my career as a Deschutes County Commissioner, I have no uh, direct or perceived conflict, so I, I can proceed. Does any party wish to challenge commissioner based on ex parte contacts, biases, or conflicts? As no challenges are presented prior to opening the hearing, does anyone have any procedural objections to the public hearing? Seeing none, the hearing is now open. Staff will proceed to a brief staff report. All right, so for the staff report today, just an overview of the applicant's request. Um, so the applicant has filed a modification request to modify the resort's approved fish and wildlife management plan. Um, it actually is management plan, though I'm saying it out loud. Um, so FWMP. The FWMP is one of several required mitigation plans the resort has developed to ensure that any negative impacts on fish and wildlife will be completely mitigated. So there's no net loss of habitat, and the standard is directly tied to a Deschutes County zoning standard. So it's a management plan with the intention of mitigating. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> yes, thank you for that clarification. And oftentimes, um, this is just referenced as the no net loss standard. So the application was initially referred to a hearings officer for review. The hearings officer denied the applicant's request. Um, for today's hearing, a few significant findings to note is that the hearings officer found that the resort is only required to have one golf course. The hearings officer also found that the proposed changes are substantial. In addition, the hearings officer found that input from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is a relevant evidentiary consideration in determining the no net loss standard. In addition, the hearings officer found that the 2022 FWMP or the proposed FWMP does not cl include clear, objective, and enforceable compliance language. So following the hearings officer's decision, two appeals were filed, one by the applicant and the other by Ms. Gould, each of them raising various issues on appeal and asking the board to consider that at today's hearing as part of their review. So just um, for the board, kind of at the conclusion of today's hearing, you'll need to make a decision kind of on what the next step will be. Um, kind of four options are laid out here. So the first is that if you say when it's take more testimony, you could continue the hearing to a date and time certain. Alternatively, you could close the oral portion of the hearing but leave the written record open to a date and time certain. You could close the hearing and schedule deliberations to a date and time certain. And to the extent, um, for example, you wanted to just approve the hearings officer decision with no changes, you could close the hearing and commence deliberations today. Um, that concludes everything I have, um, but I'm available for questions from the board. Um, Caroline, one of the things I asked about on, on Monday was a, kind of a history that's kind of broader than this application of uh, other destination resorts and their fish and wildlife, uh, their um, fish and wildlife management plans um, and whether uh, essentially each of those was blessed by ODFNW um, as those other applications move forward for other destination resorts. And um, I, I just wanted to make sure that we're going to cover that sometime today. Yeah, I mean, I can touch on that briefly now. Um, I, I um, definitely want to provide a more robust response and I'll be prepared today. So if there's an open record period, I can provide more material on that. But um, I did confirm all four destination resorts where um, it's noted in the conceptual master plan approvals, which is generally when this requirement, the no net loss requirement is evaluated, have findings stating that ODF and W did review and, and most of them approve. Um, it specifically says approved their mitigation plans for the fish and, fish and wildlife impacts. Um, but I would you know, ask for, if there's an open record period, I'd be happy to prepare a more lengthy memo um, identifying those specific findings, if that would be helpful. we get to the discussion of, of how long we want to extend the record, we, yeah. can, we can talk about that. But uh, just knowing that uh, all four other destination resorts that have, have come in 
uh, with applications uh, have had ODFNW approval of their fish and wildlife management plans uh, uh, as uh, essentially as part of the application approval um, consideration um, by the county is helpful. Yeah, and I um, wanted to get to your response, but I will note for the commissioner's benefit, we received over 200 comments since um, your meeting on Monday. So I've been responding to a lot of those inquiries. Um, some, but not all of them, have been uploaded to the website. Um, I was responding to emails just as the uh, meeting was starting today as well. So um, a lot of material still coming in. Um, so just acknowledging that. Thanks for doing double duty this week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other questions? No, but um, I did have a conversation with Carolyn yesterday, and there was um, an error in a footnote from the hearings officer report that I picked up. He said three rivers, um, and it was supposed to be three sisters irrigation district in a footnote. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put that in the record. Yeah, it was a great eye for details. Yeah, it's important to note that there was a separate condition 39 that requires um, mitigation for Whiteshus Creek, um, and that is done through this three sisters irrigation district. Um, as Commissioner Adair noted. Okay, we'll proceed. Okay. So at this time, uh, applicant testimony on the matter. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Ken Katzroff. I'm an attorney at Schwab Williamson and Wyatt. 1425th Avenue, Suite 3400, Seattle, Washington, 98101. This is our team that's mostly going to be talking today. Uh, really quickly, I will come back to address your destination resort question. What I can say is that all four resorts did have a, an, a plan that wasn't necessarily approved, but ODFMW didn't have issues with it. Some of them it did say there was an approval, but no other resort had to do a fish plan. In fact, no other resort, with the exception of some phases of Eagle Crest, had to address fish impacts. So um, we'll be providing additional information in the record on that as well. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it right over to Mr. Newton, who's going to give uh, the first piece of our technical report, because in our opinion, this case is all about the no net loss standard and the evidence uh, that we've submitted for it. So Mr. Newton. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Newton with Cascade Geoengineering. Um, I'm a registered professional geologist, professional engineer, and certified water right examiner. Uh, address is 21145. Hold the microphone right at the end. Address is 21145 Scottsdale Drive, Bend, Oregon, 97701. Um, okay, so it's up, so I'll, <clears throat> I'll quit stalling with introductions. Um, okay, so based on the, on the PowerPoint that's, uh, that's up here, um, what we're looking at with, um, oops, what we're looking at, and I'm going to try to go through this quick, but if you have questions, please feel free to jump right in. So this is just getting back to um, what we're looking at right now is the, the 2008 FWMP that was issued for, um, that was prepared and approved by Thornburg um, and ODFNW back in the day um, actually was for a much bigger development of the resort. Um, so essentially, since 2008 to 2022, that plan has evolved, and so now we're in, in a place where we have a lot better information, um, more modeling, everything from the U.S. Geological Survey, Oregon Water Resources Department has done additional work in the basin. Um, so that with that additional modeling and that additional work, we're actually been able to <coughs> apply newer and better and fresher uh, material and provide better mitigation. So one of the pieces that's significant about that is, is the mitigation, right? Because that's the piece that actually saves us um, <clears throat> with the FWMP, the whole idea is there is to allow water that's in the basin to stay in the basin and be used. And one thing to keep in mind <clears throat> is that in the Deschutes Basin, based on the mitigation rules that were passed in the early 2000s, there are no new water rights actually being issued in the basin. So the only way to get a new water right isn't to get an actual water right, you're getting a new use. So you're taking an old water right and you're essentially turning that into a new water right um, but so there's no net change in the amount of water that's consumed. So when we start talking about things like wet water, paper water, consumptive use, all these kinds of things, what's important to keep in mind is that for almost 20 years now, there's no new water being issued. So it's, it's just changing what bucket the same water comes out of, but you're not allowed to grab a new bucket and grab a new scoop of water out of the, out of the trough. 
<clears throat> so, you know, just really quickly talking about, you know, kind of generally the basin, how the basin works. So, you know, on the graphic here, this, this shows uh, the study area for the Deschutes Basin. So this is essentially, uh, there's a small outline in there <clears throat> that is the Deschutes Basin, Deschutes Basin Aquifer. So the Deschutes Basin Aquifer um, and the study area covers about 4,500 square miles has an annual recharge of about three and a half million acre feet. Um, and one of the things that's significant about that annual recharge is the one thing that is well understood about this basin is that all the recharge that comes into this basin, nearly all of it, 90% or more, comes from the Cascade, so falls primarily as snow, discharges through the Deschutes River via draining both the aquifer and the river um, at Gateway, so essentially on the Deschutes River north of Madras. So, <clears throat> if we want to think of it in a crude term, all the water that comes into the toilet discharges out of the Deschutes River north of Madras. So once again, all that water comes in, it has to go out. So I always think of it as a really big bathtub. You fill it with a bunch of dirt and rocks. That's the material. The bathtub is the low permeability geology that's underneath that forces all the water to go out of the drain. <clears throat> so the fact that we get, if we happen to have an excessive uh, recharge year, lots of snowpack, lots of rain, and say we're at four million acre feet for that year, it's all going to discharge out that same drain. Um, so of that three and a half million acre feet that's there uh, of recharge annually, about 775,000 acre feet is actually consumed in the basin. And these are numbers that were kind of verified and published by the USGS back in 2017. Um, so they're pretty, uh, pretty fresh values. Um, groundwater is approximately 50 to 55,000 acre feet used annually. Surface water is about 725,000 acre feet annually. So when you look at the total volume, about one seventh of the recharge actually is picked up at some point and used. Not all that water that's diverted, that 775,000 acre feet is consumed, a lot of it goes as return flows, right? Farmer irrigates his field, it's considered about 60% of the water he puts down is actually consumed by plants and, uh, and evaporation and such. The other 40% goes back into the ground. Um, so when you go to do mitigation and you take, say, for example, the city of Bend needs mitigation, if they take a farmer's water right that's 60% consumed and they only consume 40% because they have return flows otherwise, then the amount that they have to mitigate for is the amount that they're actually going to consume. So again, it comes back to the, you know, doesn't matter if the dollars are in your wallet or in your front pocket, and you only have that amount of money to swap with at the end of the day. So of those, so of that recharge, about, you know, 0.04% um, of the recharge and 0.2% of total use the basin is, is something that Thornburg essentially is looking for. So that's an amount of water that's going to be used by the resort. So generally how the basin works, I kind of already touched on this a little bit. The graphic on the left side that's just kind of, that has that gradational blue across it, so that's a precipitation map, right? So the dark blue that you see on the left side of that graphic, that's essentially the cascades. So that gives you an idea that that's <clears throat> generally uh, precipitation rates well over 100 um, inches per year, and that's a snow water equivalent, so maybe two, 300 inches of snow, but uh, equivalent water, it's 100 inches or more. Most of the Cascades receive between 125 and 140 inches of annual precipitation, and it grades to the right to where it goes almost gray, um, whereas so you get out to Prineville and that annual precipitation is more about eight inches per year. Um, Graphic on the right, that gives you a really good idea. So the, with the Cascades, we have a young mountain range, very loose, permeable soils. So you don't see these big runoffs. These don't, you know, you don't see the Mississippi River coming out of the Cascades, right? You see these small streams and seeps that go in and out. And that's because this, the geologic material of the Deschutes Formation is very permeable. So that snowpack infiltrates rapidly as it melts it back into the ground and that's what recharges that big bathtub of an aquifer. So you get these small little rills, so if you think of taking your bathtub and you take your finger and you start drawing lines in it as it intersects the water that's saturated in that, in that, that soil and rock <clears throat> and you get it exposed, you're actually getting the aquifer coming back out into those streams. So when you look at this graphic on the right, what you're looking at is you're taking water that's recharged from the high elevations of the Cascades and then to the south, you know, Lapine um, and 
the Newberry area, again, if you follow the dark green vegetation, that's where more precipitation falls. <clears throat> so as it moves into the, into the uh, aquifer, it starts moving to the north, northeast. Essentially, it's pointed to Madras. That's where it wants to go. It, it gets funneled to Madras out through Gateway, where the, the low permeability John Day formation that is the bathtub of the aquifer daylights. So it just forces it right out of the drain there. Uh, so Thornburg's water use, you know, we have the 2022 and the 2008 FWMP. So, you know, really what it comes down to is one of the reasons that Thornburg circled back into this 2022 update is because they had in the past, you know, this goes all the way back to like 2004, they had some really big water use values that they were looking to develop in the, in the resort. And just changes over time, demands, you know, essential general public interest, those uh, those values have been reduced significantly. So we're about a 32% reduction in total overall usage. They've adjusted what the, the resort would look like, everything from green space, golf course usage, all those resort amenities, right? So that reduces that consumptive use from about 1,356 acre feet all the way down to 882. So that's a pretty big reduction. So essentially in the, in the past, they swung for the fences. Now they're just trying to get a nice infield hit. <clears throat> so with that, that, that significant change, it made sense to circle back and look at an FWMP and say, well, does that plan fit what the new resort is going to propose? Are some of the concerns that were posed in the past as far as impacts to surface water and, and kind of that cold, cool water that's left in the river, does that still fit with the new model of the resort? So in doing that, one of the big things that changed is in the past, it was very cookie cutter, right? So this this resort was originally proposed when those mitigation rules were fairly new and young and you could essentially just go off go out and buy parts right off the assembly line assemble it into whatever piece of your water right you needed to be in and send her out the door and that was reasonable there was there's no no big basis for it well okay so we've had a lot of time since then we're able to see how that mitigation is visible and operates through the system because again all the water that's in the basin is the water we have in the basement it ultimately discharges through through gateway out at madras and that's what you have so what are the changes that have occurred in the mitigation program since then so in light of that instead of going out and essentially getting those you know mass produced parts right off the assembly line and just cobbling them together and those mass produced parts were more like um, irrigation rights that were direct surface diversions. So you're just taking, <clears throat> you're, you're leaving that surface diversion in the river, but you're taking groundwater. So that's, that's certainly acceptable. However, the advantage to then mitigating instead with a majority of groundwater, when you're using groundwater, it allows that surface waters to be left in stream as they are. It allows you to um, have a more attenuated effect on the discharge of springs and back to, and return flows back to the river and the streams and springs and all that so that you have this more um, kind of a holistic approach to mitigation in that you get to <clears throat> match the actual nature of the use with the nature of the mitigation. Uh oh, things are timing out. I'm talking too much. Yep, yep. speed it up. Um, so, the, again, so just really quickly on this slide, the 2008 plan relied more heavily on a mix of surface water and some groundwater. The 2022 uh, plan relies more on, you know, more groundwater and influence that way. Um, mitigation usage, again, this is one issue that seems to come up a lot with ODF and W is they keep looking at the difference between reliability and they tie reliability to wet water versus paper water. Very different concepts. Okay, wet water is a real water right. Real water right means it's actually usable. And usable means you can divert the stream if the water's in the stream and there's water in your well and you can pump it. So one thing to keep in mind is that when it comes to surface water, which is usually what's regulated in the Oregon, groundwater is l much less regulated. Surface water, in this basin, <clears throat> there has never been a live flow water right holder that has been regulated off on the Deschutes Basin. They haven't. That's a blanket statement. We even verified it again with the water master last year. So here we have, what, a third year of drought. We talked to Jeremy, what, September, I think? Yeah. And again, 
no regulated off-surface water user because the water rights in the basin are heavily controlled by the groundwater system. The groundwater system is strong, robust, lots of recharge, it moves through the system, and we have wet water. So again, when we have mitigation, that mitigation is real water that's actually been used. So if you go to transfer that and create mitigation where you alleviate one groundwater right in lieu of use for a new water right, that has to have reliability. So the Water Research Department, during their process, they look at the reliability of that water right. So if that water right is just a stream that dries up and there's flow one in 10 years, that's not, that's not a reliable, that's not wet water. That might be paper water right, and I could certainly hand that to you, which would be similar to me going and photocopying a $100 bill and saying, here's your bonus. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. Mitigation in this basin has to be real water, have reliability, has a reliability analysis, and when you go to make changes to a water right like that, whether it's to cancel it to use in lieu of a new right or transfer that surface water in use for groundwater, the Water Research Department does a review to see if that water's been used. And it's not just that it's been used in its entirety in the last five years, because if there are any questions in that, the department can go back to 15 years. And you have to show that each increment of that time, that water's been not only used, but it's also been available for use. That's, that's huge. So this is really something that folks get stuck on, paper right versus wet right, paper water versus wet water. Mitigation has to be wet water. There isn't any way around that. So <coughs> if I could, if yeah, I could go ahead, Phil. Other, if I could put it into other terms, essentially water that is, uh, water that is being pulled out of the ground, water that is being taken out of a stream, mm -hmm. um, in my mind is, is legitimate water for mitigation. Water that you have the right to take out of the ground or take out of a stream, but you haven't been taking out of the ground or out of a stream, um, you can give that up and it doesn't necessarily lead to improvements or mitigation of impacts uh, uh, on fish and wildlife habitats. So can you, can you say that all of the w mitigation water being offered here is currently being either extracted from the ground or extracted from the river or, or creeks on an annual basis. So before you answer, can we clarify whether or not our time is going to be reduced by questions asked and answered? Previously, I know the board the has. The time will be extended just like a soccer ball game. Great, okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what a good analogy. <laughs> it took me a while to understand what was happening in a soccer game, but now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> L luckily, I have two sons that both play soccer, so. <clears throat> um, so uh, the water rights that are here, and actually on this slide that's up on your screen now, we actually have a bunch of the water rights listed that ha have been purchased and are in for use of mitigation. And all of those rights, up until the moment that they were purchased and used for mitigation, were being used. So the, the, so there's, I, th I see that you have two questions in there, Phil, because one is, is that water being used? Because just because you have that bill in your wallet doesn't mean you're ever spending it, because you have to to be able to use it for mitigation in the first place. The other is, is once that water becomes available, if it wasn't, again, there are no new water rights being issued in this basin. So if, uh, if Thornburg wasn't purchasing those water rights for mitigation, someone else will. And there, in m multiple of these water rights, there has been a backup or multiple backup purchasers to grab that water for use. So it doesn't just look at, th here's the question that I saw that was not asked, but there, which is that water is being used. And yes, this slide perfectly exemplifies that it has been used up to when it was acquired for mitigation. <laughs> and moving into the future, it will continue to be used. And whether Thornburg Resort and these water rights move forward or not, these water rights will be picked up by someone that will use them in the future. So they have been used, they have to have been proven to have been used, and they have been, up to when they've been acquired for mitigation, and they will be used in the future, whether it's by Thornburg Resort or <coughs> whomever ends up with those water rights, if for whatever reason the resort is diminished or whatever. So. That, does that help with you? Okay. Um, just again, you have lots of reports that have been done over the last um, six to eight months. Um, you know, there's ones from Four Peaks, 
Um, there's lots of correspondence from ODF and W. Pradeep, uh, Pradeep had, of Four Peaks had produced multiple modeling reviews, um, all showing that all the mitigation essentially not only does it meet the need, but actually makes beneficial improvements to the system um, based on timed and, and you know, um, um, pinpoint, essentially pinpoint use of mitigation to mitigate the actual use that's by the resort. Um, RSI did some extensive thermal modeling, um, and there'll be some discussion of that as well. Um, I did some thermal ba mass balance um, and also looked at some of the water rights and such. Um, so in this slide, there's a little, this is a little animation. Hopefully it's going to run. All right, so what we're looking at here is you have, <clears throat> this is the basin as you see it, as the blue comes up. So here's, um, here's Thornburg. That's a simulation of if Thornburg was pumping. So the red, if there was no mitigation, the red is where you start to see impact w over, over you know, decades of use, you would see impacts in the system. So, as, so that's just assuming no mitigation. So again, that would prove that hey, if, if there's no mitigation required, it would have impacts in the system. Okay, so as this graphic moves along, you're going to start seeing these blue dots. So these blue dots represent all the mitigation that is currently um, owned. Oh, sorry, this is the 2008 version. Um, th and so you can see a bunch of that red turned blue, but not all of it turned blue. So again, you have, if we would just stick with the 2008 plan, you would end up with some areas that still have an impact, yet on paper we met the requirement and in fact the requirement was approved. So if we jump ahead again, here we have it assuming the 2022 version which has reduced uh, water usage and now we have mitigation that more accurately reflects where the potential impacts are. So as you can see the red turning blue because you have pumping at the same time, but you also have your mitigation in effect, and now your little cartoon's done, and what you end up with is we've mitigated the impacts. Any questions about this slide? This is kind of a big one. Let's keep going. We may have to study that scenario, but I don't know that we have time right now. Right. Well, yeah. Real quick, Jim, if you can finish. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of leave these here. So this is, these slides have the water rights, mitigation, all this kind of stuff that's proposed in the slides. Um, so here's a here's a really quick couple of graphics that based on modeling. So even with you know full build out after decades uh, and Thornburg, th these are kind of the potential pumping effects within the basin. Um, so some of the biggest areas that we'd have are you know up to about four inches of impact um, based on pumping from the resort. Um, this is another well. This is a um, um, Ghoul's well um, that was <clears throat> in a zone based on those other maps that would have up to about four inches of impact. So one of the things that's significant, you know, you're talking about a 600 feet deep well, static water level was reported at 518, so about 82 feet of saturation of water in the column. Um, four inches of impact, <coughs> you know, you're, you're talking about an area that has a specific capacity of probably well, I just tested it well yesterday, there was about 35 gallons per minute per foot of drawdown. So if we drew down four inches, we've effectively taken a few gallons per minute of capacity out of a well that has 82 feet of potential drawdown. So the likelihood of an impact for a domestic well that's usually is equipped with a pump that's on the five to 10 gallon per minute range, the pump in it would likely not draw it down but a few inches as well. So. Uh, quick summary, uh, water usage overall redu reduced in the plan of water to meet water demand, um, model groundwater pumping impacts, the resorts mitigated are targeted to provide overall benefit, and it does meet the no net loss standard. Okay. Great. Thank you. No. Kelly. Kelly. So we have somebody online that's going to... Yeah. While we're while we're raising uh, this other person to uh, raising up, we will have a we have a, a fish biologist who provided a video of his PowerPoint. We were planning to play it, but it looks like we're going to run out of time. So instead, we're just going to submit it to the record for folks to to view it. Okay, Kelly, please proceed. 
Yeah, uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, for the record, I'm Kelly Vache at Max Depth Aquatics, and I'm at 3329 Southwest Cascade Avenue in Corvallis, Oregon. Um, Jim, do you have a copy of my slides? No. No, they don't have your slides. Just uh, go ahead and play it, Kelly. And can I share my screen? Yes, yep. you should be able to. Yeah, we're having nods of yes here, so you have the Oops. opportunity. I've got it. Thank you for bearing with me. Hopefully you can go really quick. <laughs> I will go really quick. I wanted to Great. talk just a little bit about um, some modeling we did looking at thermal impacts of the pumping and mitigation plan on the Middle Deschutes River and Wychus Creek. So basically we took the, the um, 2022 version of Jim's animation, uh, the hydrology, and ran a temperature uh, simulation to look at, at impacts of pumping and mitigation. Um, this is a brief overview of, of the um, study region that we use with the temperature modeling. And um, we started at uh, Wikiup Reservoir um, and then through the Deschutes River down to Lake Billy Chinook and included explicitly uh, White Shoes Creek in the simulation. We used a model called C2 KW, which is a one dimensional uh, temperature and water quality model developed at the Washington Department of Ecology and simulated the system uh, across 500 meter segments. So every 500 meters within um, the reaches that we're looking at here, we can say something about um, the temperature simulation. Um, for our work, we uh, used uh, about a six month period from uh, um, April through October um, 2016 as an average year. And again, we implemented the, the changes that, that Jim's animation outlined um, to the stream discharge and used the model to look at impacts on temperature. Uh, this is a quick slide looking at some of the inputs that we use. The, the model relies on hourly, uh, hourly weather data, which is Third here, air, point, uh, air temperature, dew point, um, relative humidity, and wind speed. Um, these are hourly data, so we see diurnal fluctuations and we see uh, movement through the summer as, as, um, as things warm up and, and cool off after about August or September. Uh, in this application, we use LIDAR data to define bed slopes, uh, channel widths, near stream elevation and vegetation height to calculate hourly shading. And we use estimates of groundwater exchange and, and temperatures. When we run a model like this, we um, can look at results over time and in space. In this case, we're looking at results over space. Um, this is a plot of temperature from here. It's about Wikiup Reservoir. We move down um, through the bend area uh, and then drain into Lake Billy Chinook. Um, this is a view of temperature. We see some changes in temperature where primarily where uh, tributaries come in. This is the Little Deschutes River. You see a big drop down near Lake Billy Chinook where a series of springs and White Shoes Creek come in. They're relatively cold, so they drop the temperature of the water. Um, this is a look at the longitudinal profile of discharge for a particular point in time. Uh, we see a big jump in discharge at the Little Deschutes River as it comes into the chutes. We see a big drop uh, as we move through Bend, and those are just the series of diversions that you're all familiar with in Bend. And then here we see that increase in, in uh, stream discharge associated with White Shoes Creek and the downstream springs. Our process is to look at a series of scenarios. So we calibrate the model to observe uh, stream discharge and stream temperature at points where observations are made. Then we change the hydrology again based on the animation that you just saw and compare the results for a temperature we call the, um, the calibrated version of baseline model. And then we look at differences between that baseline model and the scenario. In this chart, these are time series plots. So it goes from April uh, through October. Here we're looking at discharge, and this is a plot of measured and modeled. The long story is that the model does a nice job of capturing stream discharge, um, which is outlined here. And this third chart is the same time series except for stream temperature, again, measured and modeled, indicating that the model um, does a nice job of capturing uh, both the seasonal pattern of, of stream temperature and the diurnal pattern. In this case, this is a particular spot in time. This one happens to be at Benham Falls, but we have these charts for all of those 500 meter reaches in the system. Kelly, can you hit the last Kelly, couple of high level points, please? Yep, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, will, I will skip down to the right. high level points. Um, what we wanted to do was look at um, the impact on temperature. 
Um, this little chart shows the change in discharge associated with um, the mitigation plan. So we tend to see increases in stream discharge throughout the system. Those increases in stream discharge translate to very small changes in stream temperature. For the most part, those small changes in temperature result in um, a cooling effect. But in all cases, these numbers are well below um, state stream temperature standards, which are defined at a tenth of a degree Celsius. These are um, tend, tend to be much smaller than that. So the, the long and short is that given the detailed stream uh, temperature modeling that we did, um, essentially, um, given the mitigation, the impacts on temperature are effectively zero. So broad stroke, I can end increased flows, decreased temperatures across all modeled stream areas. Yeah. Any questions for the commission That's before we? The modeling indicates given, given the, the um, results for the hydrology that Jim outlined in, in the animation. Thank Correct. You. So I do have questions to the big picture, making sure I'm understanding. We have a, a set of uh, uh, water rights, and the implementation of these water rights means pumping will happen, uh, groundwater pumping. But by using the, the authority of, of transferring those rights, some of these diversions won't happen, historical diversions. I, I think this is the high-level statement, which is going to be good for the river in the end. So using water out of the ground but not diverting it during irrigation season referring to this list of water rights certifications, certificates. Correct, and how, how things are kind of being moved. Joe. Go ahead. Real just, quick. Just so as I say, yeah, we're about 30 minutes, but yeah, I mean, let's get some time here. I'm not, I don't think we need minutes. to. Well, uh, as I say, let's, you said, I want to get good information you out. Said, do we have any questions? Yep. Do you want to, us to ask questions now or wait till Joe's done? I, I just have a, a brief um, message. My name is Joseph Eilers. Uh, my address is 20834 Morningstar Drive, Bend. I'm a professional hydrologist, and uh, I work with Dr. Vache on, uh, on the modeling. Uh, after all of our groundwater and surface modeling was completed, we also took a look at uh, the change in vegetation uh, at the Thornburg Resort that would result as a, as a consequence of the project and the additional thinning that they have uh, agreed to do uh, in concert with BLM. And what we found is that those actions, at a minimum, would uh, save about 300 acre feet uh, per year initially, and those levels would increase uh, with time. So that what you're seeing with, uh, with both the groundwater and the temperature modeling doesn't even reflect uh, the positive effects associated with the juniper harvest that would take place on the Thornburg Resort property uh, per se and the adjacent BLM lands. And that concludes my point. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have, I can do this in 30 seconds, and then uh, if there's other questions. So in my 30 seconds, uh, we have kind of updated copies of the Fish and Wildlife Mitigation Plan, uh, and we, all we did is we reorganized it so that the first uh, section two, actually not the first section, but section two, uh, includes all of the mitigation measures and more detailed, more detail on compliance and reporting, which is really the the issue of the hearings officer. So all that has been dealt with. I printed 20 copies. I'm going to give one to Ms. Gould and her team um, so that they have them. And then if anybody else wants them, I'm just going to put them up here. Uh, the other thing I need to address really quickly is um, because we have this update, uh, we requested changes uh, in our burden of proof in the application to uh, condition 38, which is how we implement it. And essentially what we've done is we've uh, basically made a very minor change in order to say, as amended by the 2022 plan, and added a new condition, condition 40, that says we have to comply with this plan, um, including uh, the compliance and reporting uh, outlined in section two of that plan. So um, that's all I have to say, because <laughs> we're going to need changes to the, uh, so this is, yeah, that's sure. the plan. This is, yeah, a new formatted plan. Correct. Uh, as of today. So this is in the record today. Yeah, and, and it's it, none of the measures that we're planning are, are any different. Mm -hmm. So um, everything's the exact same. It's just we tried to make it easier because uh, I think the hearings officer got caught up on it a little bit. It wasn't exactly clear how we were doing compliance and reporting. Um, so we've, we've restructured it. So all of that is at the beginning. And then the, the last portion is uh, all uh, background.
one thing that he was that he didn't understand is that we own all the water. Yeah, and we own all the water. That's the other thing that he didn't understand is that we actually currently own all the mitigation water. So questions from the board for any of our technical team that's still <coughs> here, um, if there are any. Um, I really appreciate that you've done um, some pretty complicated modeling. I really appreciate that you're uh, you've analyzed for vegetation management um, all of these things. You know, all of the things that you've described have the potential to uh, result in improved aquatic habitat. Um, the, the, the challenge that I have is that we are seeing a model, we are hearing analysis from the applicant. And uh, we need, uh, like I need someone to uh, validate uh, the model and analysis that you are providing that is not the applicant. Um, I, I have, you know, I personally have a significant amount of background in hydrology um, and uh, yeah, aquatic and terrestrial habitat, but I am not expert enough to um, validate your assumptions in your model. I mean, especially not just after just, you know, seeing a presentation for a couple, couple of minutes. Uh, you know, as the consumer of this information, I need, I need some kind of uh, external objective uh, validation so that I know that I'm not just looking at a black box. So uh, I'll address that because I, I know exactly where you're going. And you'll see that there's a comment letter from ODFNW that was submitted, I believe, yesterday. They agree with our modeling. And so uh, that's, that's the best we can do. I mean, the way that Oregon Ladies works, as was addressed in the work session yesterday, is, you know, applicants provide evidence. You have to weigh that evidence. If the county wants to, at some point in time, hire their own hydrologist, they're welcome to do that. But the process as it stands is it's your job to weigh the evidence. And you can make findings whether or not you find the technical experts as credible. The hearings officer certainly did. Um, and Joe wants to respond also. <laughs> yes, in terms of the independent review, I, I agree with you that that is an important aspect of any of these uh, scientific endeavors. With regard to the uh, surface water quality model that Dr. Vache presented, we, our team was selected to do this work for Thornburg in part because we had extensive history in y applying the same model on the Deschutes River. So we, we've applied this model on the lower Deschutes River for uh, uh, PGE and have published that in the peer-reviewed literature. And we also applied that model from Wikiup uh, down to Tumalo uh, for the habitat conservation plan, which was reviewed extensively. So, so the only difference here is we had the opportunity to model the middle of the shoots uh, where we hadn't before, but we had the benefit of all of this calibration information going into the uh, activity. So, uh, you know, so we didn't have to start uh, at, from scratch, and a lot of people have looked at uh, what we've done both on the lower Deschutes and on the upper Deschutes as well. Thank you for that. Um, so again, he did the HCP work. <laughs> so I mean, it's kind of hard to come up with a better expert for this modeling. I do, I do have to say that what actually made my red flag go up was the discussion of the juniper treatments because um, yeah, I, I actually know a whole lot about uh, juniper treatments and, and uh, restoration of sage strep uh, gra sage step um, habitat areas, and um, if you were using, if the basis of your uh, assumptions about what kind of groundwater effects uh, juniper treatments is going to have are are coming out of the Crooked River Basin, where there's been a lot of study, uh, the the soil, the groundwater depths, uh, the hydrogeology of the Crooked River Basin is completely different. Uh, than the area around Thornburg. And I, I just, uh, like, you, people, you know, this is the subject of a, a lot of legislative discussion right now, and I will just continue to tell people that juniper treatments on this side of the Deschutes Basin really have no demonstrable or significant impact on the, le the depths of groundwater, the, the, our, our groundwater resources. Uh, you know, in Deschutes County. Uh, 
Well, still the same mechanism is is applicable in that the junipers intercept uh, uh, water falling on the system and in the shallow uh, soils down to about four feet. So, so some of that I agree that there are differences in soil type that will affect uh, total transpiration rates. But I think the general process is applicable throughout the the juniper occidentalis range. So. I, I, I disagree. Okay. Well, okay. So bottom line, it's, it's, we don't rely upon that. Hang on, yeah. to, to try to. I know that that wasn't your main, it wasn't emphasized as your main mitigation. Um, and, and so kind of just kind of bring it in at the end is like, and we're doing this too. I was just like. Understood. Right. So, <clears throat> and maybe this is me having more ears when I hear questions, because in your statement about Juniper, um, there's and the Crooked River Basin, Crooked River Watershed, um, you're right, there are significant differences. And as a person that practices hydrogeology as a specialty um, and water resources engineering, um, there's huge difference is in the Crooked River and the Deschutes River and the Deschutes Basin and the watersheds for both. And one of the reasons why when the, at the introduction of that PowerPoint, the study area by the USGS, it essentially clips, and if, you, and if I were to show you the geology map, from that same report, there's only one small little sliver that's over by, essentially, once you get down into the Crooked River Canyon, where you drive down the hill into downtown Primeville, the top of the canyon is, is Deschutes geology, the bottom of the canyon is Crooked or John Day Clarno formation. Again, drastically different geology, drastically different watersheds, which is also why areas very far east of there are not included in the study. They're not part of the mitigation because doing mitigation in that area has very little, if any, effect other than, you know, essentially a little bit of seepage once it gets back into the Crooked River. So again, the mitigation here is focused on the areas that's important to not only Thornburg and the impacts Thornburg creates, but in, a area, in the ability to offset that mitigation. So I, I guess I would strongly encourage you to, to focus on the Deschutes Basin without comparison to the Crooked River watershed because they are drastically different. The geology is different. The hydrogeology is different. Um, the mechanism to provide mitigation is drastically different as well because they're, they're just different. They are night and day different. There is not a bathtub full of nice permeable um, rock and volcanic material. You essentially have a bathtub full of mostly clays and much older devitrified volcanics that hold very little water and discharge very little water. No, I'm I'm completely prepared to focus on the on Great. the upper that's side of the basin. Perfect. That's a that's a that's a good answer. Just that if you're pulling in, uh, if you're pulling in arguments uh, that are nope. founded okay. in research in other places. Uh, I'm going to have concerns about that. No, the, and the and the juniper is just, you know, that's the the sprinkles on top of a cake. We're talking about cake. We're not talking about sprinkles. <laughs> What's so the talking about there? sprinkles, something I can relate to. So uh, you say you're going to uh, re uh, remove approximately 3,400 acres of junipers on BLM land. Then you have that kind of arrangement with them. And originally, I think the document said like 5,000 acres of juniper would be. Um, worked on so most of that is the BLM land then correct so uh, we're we're thinning both on BLM land uh, and then we're also thinning on our own land and clearing on our own land so that that factors everything that we're doing both on-site and off-site as part of uh, our own practices internally as well as things that we're doing for uh, wildlife enhancement on BLM land but but to be clear also to your point the the off-site mitigation the other uh, terrestrial mitigation is we're not making any changes to that plan okay we're only talking about fish impacts and aquatic impacts thank you very much for your testimony oh, i have one more question. oh please yep okay um so the hearings officer's denial was based on on two two arguments um and the second one is that the the 2022 FWMP does not contain clear, objective, and enforceable compliance language. So um, we we can potentially be convinced that you know this is a this is a sound mitigation plan, um, or what's being proposed is is valid mitigation. But uh, the hearings officer was concerned that you know it's there, we we don't have assurances um, that this mitigation will be delivered. 
and I didn't uh, I, 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 little very little of your testimony addressed this concern from uh, the hearings officer I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about kind of how you provide the assurances that the mitigation that you are promising will be delivered so you know the the really straightforward answer to that is is Thornburg will not be allowed to use water unless mitigation has been provided and approved by the Water Resources Department and timely applied to that water right. So what that means is just because somebody gives you the keys, if the car is not built, you don't get to go for a, a joyride. So in this case, the, the, the assertion and the, um, oh, the, one of the things that comes up a lot is that ODFNW likes to see wet water in the stream. They, they, they're, they're, they're groundwater averse because you can't see the water, it must not be there. Um, however, when you look at it from the Water Resource Department, when the, the, eight, the state agency that is actually in charge of all the waters of the state, the ones that have all the other experts that work for the state that deal with water, all that mitigation has to go through them, be reviewed by them, approved by them, assigned to Thornburg before Thornburg can ever use a drop of water out of a well. So, to, so the assertion that whether it was an opposition, a casual observer, or ODFNW, that there may not be a you know, clearly defined avenue to show that mitigation is going to happen, water use at the resort can't happen without the mitigation having been fully vetted and applied and approved by the Water Research Department, which is the agency that approves all water usage in the state. The, the second thing, Commissioner, uh, we've been working with ODFNW. That was a concern of theirs is compliance. And uh, we have put additional reporting requirements in the FWMP that uh, call for annual reporting, a number of different steps uh, that they're included in uh, that directly uh, would lead to enforcement measures. I mean, if we report something that is different than what we said, uh, they get an annual report that would continue uh, into the future. So uh, both from a water resources standpoint as well as a reporting to the county, to ODFNW, uh, those would occur on an annual basis. For, for example, we, we have a requirement uh, proposed that we provide annual reports to the fi local field office here on top of the county. So we've been working with ODFNW on exactly this issue. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your testimony Thank you so today. Thank you. So, um, at this time, uh, agency comments, uh, I know it was mentioned 10 o'clock, really but late. yeah, I know exactly. I, I know it was mentioned 10 o'clock. Was this going to be a remote testimony or? or? Oh, oh, here we go. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Sorry about the time slip here today. Uh, good morning. Um, Ellen Grover with Best Pest and Krieger. I'm uh, legal counsel for the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs Reservation of Oregon. My address is 360 Southwest Bond, Ben 97702. Uh, with me uh, this morning is Austin Smith, Jr., the general manager for the Confederated Tribes. Unfortunately, our time did run out for um, Bobby Bruno, who is the secretary treasurer and CEO of the tribe, to be able to be with us this morning. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Austin uh, to provide his comments. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Commission, for um, having us here. You know, I just want to talk about um, my, well, let me get started. Austin Smith Jr., P.O. Box 689, Warm Springs, Oregon. Um, so thank you for having us here. You know, I want to talk a little about um, this project and how, you know, the tribe stands. You know, we are co-managers. We work directly with Fish and Wildlife. You know, we are in the basin. We have water rights. We have a lot um, in play here. And, you know, at this time, we kind of want a... Um, to collect ourselves really and understand all these mitigations and how they um, will impact or produce or be productive for not only our fish species but our cultural resources and our cultural foods. So, um, you know, a lot of the co-management plans are already in place. You know, there's a lot going on in the basin. You know, there's um, a lot as from um, from a standpoint of resources that 
water has impacted, you know, there's drought conditions, climate change, and, you know, we plan for these and we work directly with a lot of the agencies out here. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, I appreciate the applicant's testimony and um, bringing information to the table, but, you know, some of the requests that the tribes has is to look to confer with the applicant, ODFW, and other agencies. Um, I'd like to put this on the record, see if we can get um, a 30-day review of some of this information so the tribes can um, then be, have consultation um, with, with the applicants and ODFW. Um, <clears throat> I would also like to talk about some of the um, plans and um, memorandum of understandings we currently have with ODFW. So the tribes have um, the, a treaty right which includes um, hunting, harvest, and fishing within deceded lands, you know, roughly 10 million acres. Um, and a part of that, you know, we have our own self-management for hunting rights. And so um, when we talk about water use and what's being impacted here, we talk about habitat impacts. And we've dealt with this um, since time immemorial. You know, um, what are the impacts to our cultural resources? And this term is big game species. So we work pretty collaboratively with ODFW on the development of a uh, plan to manage our big game resources. And in terms of Thornburg, you know, it's directly with an adjacent to BLM lands where my family hunts, where my family gathers. <clears throat> and so what does that mean? You know, there's a development of a golf course, a development of any type of resort or any of that sort it does have substantial impacts not only to migratory corridors, it has, um, it brings in deer, elk, um, smaller game species, high density areas, it removes a lot of the habitat. And so that's something we keep an eye on um, from every aspect, you know, throughout our seeded lands and beyond those borders as well. So I just want to keep that, um, let the commission know that that's something that we keep an eye on and we walk, watch pretty regularly. <coughs> Thank you. Um, did you have? Uh, so that's a very specific request for a 30 day review. Uh, and yeah, just like to understand more about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least keep the record open for 30 days, preferably 60. Um, you know, ODFW and the applicant and everybody has a has a big head start. Um, you know, over the tribe on understanding these issues. Um, the tribe does have the technical expertise because it is a co-manager to evaluate all the modeling. I mean, um, the tribe is actually a co-owner of the uh, Pelton project uh, for which Mr. Eilers, you know, mentioned modeling. So we're very familiar with um, these, you know, types of models and we can understand them, but we just haven't been given an opportunity to really uh, engage with the applicant yet and with ODFW to understand what the, you know, the concerns are. Um, just, a, you know, a little bit of background, I think, for why um, Warm Springs is raising its hand, you know, now is, in, de in December, um, so the tribe for decades, as you know, has been working on um, water resource and fishery management in the Deschutes Basin, um, you know, actively. They've been a co-manager since time immemorial uh, because of their uh, uh, treaty-based, federally um, reserved rights. And um, the, the tribe has just assiduously um, continued to advance kind of its um, its treaty uh, protected rights in the basin. And part of that expression has been uh, through its participation with the Pelton Project. Um, the tribe uh, in 2000 um, entered into a global settlement agreement with Portland General Electric, under which it um, is now a 49.99% owner of that project. And um, we, t together with, 20, with 21 other settling parties, um, including Deschutes County, um, entered into a relicensing settlement agreement for the Pelton Hydroelectric Project before FERC. Um, and as part of that um, relicensing um, settlement agreement was a fish passage plan. And key to that fish, fish passage plan uh, was a reintroduction program um, for um, uh, traditional and treaty protected uh, fisheries for the tribe, and that's um, steelhead, chinook, and sockeye salmon. Um, so since uh, 2005, the FERC, FERC issued the, the new 50-year license, and in part that 50-year license 
was an anomaly in terms of term because of the, the major commitments that this region has made to fish and wildlife um, improvements in the basin, most particularly the reintroduction program. And the reintroduction program also triggered uh, a, you know, a habitat conservation planning in the basin. And um, primarily that's been um, uh, advanced through the irrigation districts uh, and the city of Prineville uh, for um, managing their Endangered Species Act uh, take liability. Uh, but nevertheless, what the Habitat Conservation Plan is intended to do is to improve and support the habitat that's associated with these fisheries um, and for the reintroduction program. So two of the streams that are of particular importance to the Habitat Conservation Plan are the Wychus Creek and Crooked. And so the tribe said, okay, uh, we just received a, a biological opinion from um, NOAA fish uh, in late December. Uh, it includes specific temperature requirements for Wychus Creek uh, and provides some um, important information about the Crooked River and how it supports particularly the steelhead species. And uh, you know, we saw that there was an appeal associated with the hearings officer's denial of this change in a fish and wildlife management plan that appears to have direct impacts to Wychus and Crooked. Now, we understand that the applicant is saying those are beneficial imp impacts, but the tribe just has a lot of caution about just making sure that it understands uh, really what the impacts are. You, the context that we have here uh, is, is significant. You have climate change impacts. Uh, which are acknowledged by ODFW as impacting groundwater flows. You have, um, you know, direct reliance on streams that are specifically impacted by the resort. Um, and so the tribe just really wants to slow down a little bit, get caught up, um, and, you know, be able to help uh, the commission understand, um, you know, really whether the applicant uh, can, can or has met their burden of proof to fully um, you know, address any impacts or degradation to the fish and wildlife habitat. Great. Any questions? No. Will Bobby be submitting then something to the record if it continues to be open? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Bruno. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I'm I'm really interested in um, tr trying to make this additional consultation period happen. Uh, one of the things that it would be really helpful for us to to understand um, from the, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs is uh, is this mitigation plan better than the 2008 mitigation plan because I, I you know that is you know on some level that is the choice that we are trying to make right now is do does Thornburg proceed with its 2008 uh, fish and wildlife management plan or um, do we uh, approve this modification for a different fish and wildlife management plan and and so just to, um, some perspective on you know we think this is better or we think this is worse for these reasons would be helpful understood thank you Thank you very much for joining us today and being part of this process. Okay, and thank you for uh, the applicant and Ms. Gold uh, for your accommodation of our agenda Didn't request. quite hit the 10 o'clock time, but yeah, I know. <laughs> we got there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, uh, appellant Gould. Oh, oh, sorry, okay. Thank you for joining us. Uh, looks like we have ODFW. Danette, do you want to start? Yeah, do we have some time for ODFW comments? Yes, I just wasn't seeing what was going on here. Great. Good morning, Chair DeBone and Commissioners. My name is Danette Vissera, and I'm the Water Policy Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. My address is 4034 Fairview Industrial Drive Southeast, Salem, Oregon 97302. ODFW appreciates the opportunity to provide comment to you today regarding the appeal of Hearings Officer Frank's decision regarding the 2022 modification of the Fish and Wildlife Management Plan. As technical experts on fish and wildlife habitat needs in Oregon, ODFW plays a critical role in determining impacts to fish and wildlife resources and recommending means to offset the impacts if applicable in accordance with the county comprehensive plan and implementing ordinances. I will, I will defer you to our written comments provided yesterday for our full comments and items for you to consider in making your decision. 
but would like to make a few brief comments today. First, I'm going to call on Jerry George, ODFW's local district fish biologist, to set the stage regarding ODFW's interest in the Deschutes Basin. Jerry? Good morning, Chair DeBone, Commissioner Chang, Commissioner Adair. Uh, my name is Jerry George. Uh, I'm the district fish biologist for ODFW for the Upper Deschutes Watershed. My address is 61374 Perel Road, Bend, Oregon, 97702. As an employee at ODFW, I'm reminded every day that our mission is to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and their habitats for the use and enjoyment of the present, by present and future generations. The proposed Thornburg development is located in an area with a close hydraulic connection between the regional groundwater aquifer and surface water discharge into the Deschutes River. The effect of groundwater pumping at the Thornburg Resort is expected to have its greatest impact on spring discharges and stream flows and temperatures in the Crooked River between Osborne Canyon and Lake Billy Chinook, the Deschutes River downstream of Lower Bridge, and Lower Wychus Creek. In addition to being recognized as state scenic waterway and national scenic wild and wild and scenic rivers, these streams support native bull trout, summer steelhead, Chinook salmon, red band trout, and mountain whitefish. These trout, salmon, and whitefish require consistent sources of clean, cold water to complete their life histories, and zones of groundwater discharge provide critically important habitat. These are areas that provide refuge to fish, in particular resting and holding habitat for bull trout, Chinook salmon, and steelhead before their final push to the spawning grounds. <laughs> These zones of abundant cold clean water are especially vital during the summer when flows are reduced due to other demands and temperatures are elevated. Under the lens of ongoing drought, reduced stream flow, and a warming climate, the preservation of these river reaches and critical habitats is now more important than ever. <clears throat> However, the continued and increased groundwater withdrawal for agricultural, residential, and municipal needs will further and cumulatively affect springs and further degrade stream habitat quantity and quality. Since the original Thornburg Fish and Wildlife Management Plan was developed over 14 years ago, the region has experienced an advancement in the science and understanding of regional groundwater processes, a boom in growth and water consumption, a serious decline in groundwater levels, the development of a groundwater mitigation program, and a social awakening demanding sustainable development and careful conservation of water resources <coughs> in the high desert. A new mitigation plan, especially one that involves a broader geogra geographic scope, both in terms of source of mitigation and its impacts, requires a fresh and critical analysis using the best available science. The new mitigation plan is also somewhat unconventional as it is a blend of surface and groundwater transfers from across the watershed and relies upon transfer and non-use rather than measurable and legally protected in-stream water rights. For ODFW to support such a plan, we must be confident that mitigation is reliable and protective in areas of impact and conservation concern and over a range of expected hydrologic and environmental conditions. I'll now turn it back to Danette. Thanks, Jerry. So I will now quickly comment our, on our engagement in the mitigation plan development. ODFW has expended much staff time in coordination with the applicant regarding mitigation for impacts to fish, wildlife, and habitats, both for the 2022 plan before you today and on the previous 2008 plan. Although we don't always agree, we have a good working relationship with the applicant and efforts have been made on both sides to reach concurrence that the plan results in no net loss to the fish and wildlife resources per the county code. While the overarching concept of the plan appears to have merit, ODFW has not yet received information sufficient to allow it to conclude that the assumptions placed on the modeling efforts are valid. We discussed this in more detail in our written testimony specifically regarding the importance of reliability and past use of water rights. In response to Commissioner Chang's earlier question, Mr. Newton stated that all water rights being transferred have been used, but we have not received that information despite asking repeatedly. 
If there are records regarding use of the rights, we would be happy to review them for consistency and past use. That said, today we find no substantial evidence in the record to determine that the no net loss or net degradation standard has been met. We appreciate the county's continued coordination and protection of Oregon's fish, wildlife, and habitats. And Jerry and I are happy to answer any questions today. Thank you. So this is Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, we've heard testimony that says the Oregon Water Resources you know, might may testify that the water has been used and is used and it can't be used unless that scenario is correct. And you're saying you don't have that information? I mean, yeah, I... So it's a difference between what's required for a transfer in water law, which is that the water right is used once, once in every five years, versus how that water actually plays out on the ground and provides benefits to fish and wildlife. So in order to maintain a water right, you just have to use it once in five years. So if these water rights have only been used once in five years, that water in reality is already in the system. And if the resort begins pumping, that would be considered somewhat a new use and somewhat result in a net, net loss to the system without that reliability information. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm gonna, we're gonna be in a decision-making position here and you know the opinion of water use and what's in the river and isn't opposed to the law and what a water right is. I mean, this is going to be interesting for a department to say this. Yeah, and just, I guess, just to remind you that you're you're looking at no net loss to the resource, uh, which is somewhat different standard than water law. Yeah, this is, this is the real challenge for me is that um, we are we are not just evaluating did you did you provide a right yeah and you know did, did you did you um did you essentially retire a right in order to have this right for x and y amount it is you know our our standard in in Deschutes County code is that there will be no net loss of uh of habitat quality or or quantity and um but, you know, to, to, to meet that standard, you know, it, it is important to me that the water, uh, the, the mitigation water is actually being extracted from either the ground or uh, uh, the streams or the river right now. That would make it a real um, replacement of water, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, for the water that's being pumped. Um, that, that would, you know, real water that's being extracted, being being left in the ground, left in the stream, uh, is what, to me, would be persuasive that uh, that there's uh, that there's not an, a there's not a net loss of habitat in the river. So, yeah, I, it, it, yeah, I'm not sure if I have any questions. I, I mean, the the two questions I I was going to ask were about, you know. Uh, ODF and W's confidence in the modeling assumptions, um, and you, you just addressed that. And about um, the the you know the 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 wetness essentially of the water um, being offered as mitigation. So um, thank you for sharing that information, or sharing sharing ODF and W's uh, opinion on that on those issues. Anything else? Nothing to add. Thank you. Any other questions? Nope. Thank you so much. Is there any other agency comments? <laughs> okay. Seeing none, uh, yeah, Appellant Gould.
Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Jennifer Brager. I'm an attorney at Tomasi Brager Dubay, 121 Southwest Morrison Street, Suite 1850, Portland, Oregon. Our office represents Annunziata Gould in opposition to Central Land and Cattle Company, Cameron Delashmit, and Pinnacle Utility LLC's application to amend the Thornburg Resort Conceptual Master Plan, Final Master Plan, and Fish and Wildlife Mitigation Plan. Collectively, I refer to the applicants as applicants or TBR and the application as the 2022 FWMP. Have you ever seen a mirage? I'm sure you, that you frequently see them in the height of winter. That ripple effect where you think you might be seeing water, only there is no water. In this specific case, now is the time to see the desert resort for the mirage that it is and recognize the reality that TBR lacks any and all required water. For this sole reason, the application before you is premature, but there is another more important reason that the application is premature. Applicants' conceptual master plan is void because TBR failed to seek and the county never held a, re a hearing on remand about Luba's October 9, 2015 decision in a Gould versus Deschutes County case. This October 9, 2015 decision was the remand from the Court of Appeals decision decided earlier in 2015 that found the county's decision on in initiation of the conceptual master plan deficient. No remand hearing occurred within the statutory timeline under ORS 215-435. Therefore, as described in greater detail in my November 7th letter, Luba's holding that the conceptual master plan is void is a binding decision on the county and applicant. The applicant has no authority to declare the Court of Appeals remand moot. As further explained in the record to the hearings officer, the conceptual master plan and final master plan are separate approvals and never became one in the same document. TBR cannot modify the void conceptual master plan and the applicant needs a new conceptual master plan. The hearings officer did not reach a conclusion on the effect of this void conceptual master plan, but it should have been the baseline for the denial. My remaining arguments are in the alternative to this baseline that a void conceptual master plan cannot be amended. Condition of approval one is mirrored in the conceptual master plan and final master plan and states that approval is based upon the submitted plan. Any substantial change to the approved plan will require a new application. TBR asserts that it can satisfy the condition in the form of a modification application. Appellant Gould has m several arguments about why prior hearings officers' interpretations do not make sense in this context and actually require new conceptual master plan and final master plan applications under these conditions. The most notable of these arguments which is directly applicable here is Luba's opinion in another Gould case issued in 2022 in the overnight lodging unit ratio modification case, which is now a final decision. There, Luba said that Ms. Gould had not identified findings of fact on which the original approval was based that would be materially affected by the application. That deficiency is remedied here and because it is so important to understand the original findings for the conceptual master plan and final master plan, I'm going to walk through these original findings. It is absolutely fundamental to the review requirements that the resort and its choice of water or water right or rights for consumption have to be finally established before a workable, certain, and binding FWMP can be prepared and reviewed. The findings of fact for condition 10 in the conceptual master plan approved approval identified specific water sources and required a water permit issued for each development phase and stated the report identifies water needs and sources including detailed plans for obtaining state water rights for new groundwater development and providing required mitigation for potential impacts to the Deschutes River. Applicant has submitted a water right application G16385 to the Oregon Water Resources Department. That water right application became the pertinent water right G17036 and the decision explained that a more detailed evaluation of the water right and water availability is provided under other criteria. So then under the heading water availability, the code required TBR to meet DCC 18113070K that in part requires 
adequate water will be available for all proposed uses at the destination resort based upon the water study and a proposed water conservation plan. TBR's conceptual master plan findings relied on an initial review conducted by OWRD to conclude there is sufficient groundwater available for the proposed use. The conceptual ma master plan findings under subsection K were based on the feasibility of meeting the mitigation requirements for this particular water right in TBR's conceptual master plan exhibit K2 and found the standard met specifically relying on OWRD's testimony that the application is likely to be approved. Finally, the county found compliance with the county standard relating to water availability can be further ensured by conditioning approval of the application on successful completion of the state water right process. Therefore, the resort shall comply with the appropriate and current water regulations as defined in state law and administered by OWRD and receive a groundwater permit from OWRD. We must not lose sight of the original finding requiring successful completion of the state water right process. The county then impo imposed conceptual master plan condition of approval 10 underlined in red on the screen. This condition remains in the conceptual master plan and is expressly tied to the specific water right in the findings G17036. The findings of fact for the final master plan approval were also based on the same water right the applicant obtained approval of a water right application, see Exhibit K2. It will become final upon a showing that the required mitigation has been provided for. A condition of approval is imposed to require documentation that mitigation and a water rights permit has been issued for each development phase. The applicant had submitted K2, a final order from OWRD documenting approval of the water right application to obtain this final master plan approval. Based on these materials and findings, the fa final master plan contains a different condition of approval 10 quoted on the screen, which still focuses on the water right. That's G17036. The conceptual master plan requires water right G17036 as the source of water supply for the resort. The final master plan only modified condition 10 as a result of the approval of G17036 but the fundamental facts have changed, and OWRD issued a superseding proposed final order that denied an extension of permit G17036 for lack of construction or beneficial use, now subject to a contested case. The 2022 FWMP modification is attempting to short circuit around the code's requirement to adhere to the original findings of fact of the conceptual master plan because the conceptual master plan's water supply is not available today. Any modification of the FWMP is premature and the application must be denied and new applications for a conceptual master plan and final master plan must be submitted. Currently, no water is available to the subject property under G17036. Therefore, G17036 is unable to provide adequate water to supply the proposed uses of the destination resort and water is not available under subsection K. This is the very basis for land use development. You've got to have water. The county's issuing building permits without water and there's no water for fire suppression. So as these structures get, get built, the risk is on the community. The FMP's 2008 finding of fact for condition 38 relied upon the impacts from the specific G17036 water permit and the specific mitigation sources to ensure that mitigation plans met DCC 18113070D's no net loss degradation criteria, approval criteria, as well as agreement by OWRD and ODFW on its content. The full 2008 FWMP is included in the record and its exhibit one details the specific consumptive water, G17036, that the mitigation plan addresses. TBR's proposed 2022 FWMP modifications have not been satisfactorily reviewed by ODFW and OWRD. Any modification of a mitigation plan without that support significantly changes the factual support for final master plan condition 38 findings of fact. So although the original approvals appear to have gathered dust over the last 15 years, the original findings are quite simple. Adequate and available supply of water is the first step to resort approval. Until there is a water supply approved by the OWRD process, the discussion of, of mitigation is premature. 
Several additional aspects of this proposal result in a substantial change to the original approvals listed on this slide. Therefore, new applications are required. I'm going to briefly turn o over the dais to Ms. Gould's Water Rights Council, Carl Anuda, to explain the status of the water rights. And I passed out this PowerPoint presentation in case. Oh, looks like you've got it going, Carl. Thank you. Uh, members of the commission, my name is Carl G. Anuda. I'm a lawyer representing Ms. Gould on water issues. My address is 735 Southwest First Avenue, Portland, Oregon, 97204. As you just heard, the really the reason you're here for this whole discussion is that the resort has now recognized that they do not have a functional water right and so they've proposed in this fish and wildlife mitigation plan for 2022 an amendment to look for different water to use different water for operations and different water for mitigation the problem for you is that the record does not support the conclusion that that new proposed plan actually will meet the no net degradation standard and that's what you have to find in order to approve the plan the real reason that it doesn't meet that standard here is because it alters the water that it's relying on and it tries to use cancellation or non-use of a water right as mitigation Let's back up for a minute to the basic facts, which it appears Mr. Newton in his testimony agrees with. The irrefutable science is if you take groundwater out of the Deschutes, it affects surface water because there's only so much water in the basin. Um, I've submitted to you as Exhibit 48 to the, my testimony uh, today, an excerpt from the testimony of a OWRD hydrologist who handled the Deschutes Basin and he's actually the one who concluded on the groundwater right that Thornburg tried to get to replace G17036 for the same amount, 9.28 CFS, in the same location. He concluded that, quote, the water will not likely be available within the capacity of the groundwater resource. When questioned under oath, this hydrologist was very clear, if you're pumping groundwater, it will ultimately reduce surface water on a bucket for bucket basis. If you pump 9.28 CFS or five CFS or even 10 gallons a minute, stream flow will ultimately be reduced by that exact same amount. So in order to mitigate for that change in surface flows to reach a no net degradation of surface flows, you need an equal amount of water put permanently protected in the stream for uh, mitigation. The problem here is Thornburg doesn't have that water. What you see in front of you in the chart is all the various water rights that Thornburg has purchased and is trying to transfer to Thornburg or trying to transfer in some other way. What you are missing is any evidence that any of those rights will be transferred to an in-stream water right, a permanently protected water right. Instead, Thornburg is proposing cancellation of a right, which just means that the next person in line, whether it's the next surface user or the nearby groundwater user, gets to take the water. That's how water law works. Um, basically, what you're seeing here is the resort is, in our view, playing a proverbial shell game with the water rights. They've lost the first original one. It doesn't, it's expired. So they're trying to move all these other pieces around. But if you look through the reality of it, it, there's no water right under the shell. It just doesn't exist. And they want the county in approving this fish and wildlife mitigation plan, which uh, now you have a new version in front of you just as today. I don't know what it says. I haven't read, seen it yet. Uh, and if I had been handed a copy of it, if I happened, was able to be there, I couldn't tell you because I wouldn't have had time to read it. And I presume that's the same for you. Uh, but they want you to say this is this new approach is all fine. You you don't have a basis for doing that without having read the plan, gotten verification, got some validation. Uh, you, you need all of that. I, I would now uh, suggest that, as ODFW said, what you're lacking here is concrete information. And what they're lacking is concrete information. What the tribe is lacking is concrete information. 
And you need to have that. The, one of the things that this new plan does that's the most problematic is it takes a commitment from the 2008 plan for 5.5 CFS of the deep Canyon Creek water going permanently protected in stream. And instead it proposes to use that water for consumptive use at the Thornburg Resort. You can do all the temperature modeling you want, but it doesn't change the fact that there will be impacts to the Crooked River and to the Deschutes River from doing what Thornburg is proposing because there's no in-stream water right mitigation. And this is not an issue of a battle of the experts, by the way. The analysis that was done by the Thornburg experts shows that there will be impacts to the crooked. The same analysis was done using the USGS model by Mr. Lambie, our expert, and we've submitted a copy of that to you. And it, it agrees there will be impacts to the crooked and that in, those impacts need to be mitigated. Now, I should mention that the four peaks analysis, they concluded that in their opinion, those impacts were not significant. I suspect that's because they're not trout or steelhead that live in the Crooked River, which has already got reduced flows and is too warm. So any reduction to the fish is significant. Uh, and it needs to be mitigated 100%. And in order to find a no net loss, that's what you need to see. And it isn't here. Um, using less water overall is a good goal. And we're pleased to see Thornburg trying to move towards that goal but pretending that you're mitigating the impacts by just not using water when it's not protected in stream is not acceptable. You have That's why ODFW demanded that there be an in-stream water right with the Deep Canyon Creek water in the 2008 Fish and Wildlife Plan. Basically, the proposal before you is premature, and we ask that you uphold the hearings officer's denial for that reason and for all the reasons we've outlined in our written testimony and in our appeal, um, if the resort can use less water over time, and it, if it can mitigate 100%, that's great. But nobody who's a rational decision maker could find, based on what's in front of you, without having actually read all this and gotten validation, that that's what you got. So you should deny you should deny the Thornburg appeal and uphold the hearings officer in this instance. I've used up more of Ms. Brager's time than I should have, so I will stop. If you have any questions, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer them at the end. Thank you. So, um, you know, under DCC 18113070D, um, you know, you can see here the Crooked River impacts that uh, Carl alluded to, but the county promises that the resort's negative impacts will be completely mitigated, so there is no net loss uh, or degradation to the resource. And ODFW's words speak well for themselves. I don't need to quote their prior testimony. It is consistent. There is not enough information to make that determination here. Um, Ms. Gould agrees with the ultimate outcome reached by the hearings officer, um, but there's not, that nothing in the plan is uh, shown to be likely and reasonably certain to succeed. Um, the hearings officer asked whether the 2022 FWMP gives clear and enforceable standards, and the answer was no, and it remains no. And I can't comment on this new condition of approval because I haven't had time to digest it, but there has been enough litigation around applicant written conditions of approval to say we need more time to analyze this. There is absolutely no rush. The applicant has identified no consumable water right to supply the resort. Let's see what water rights will supply the resort under a new CMP review for compliance with subsection K. Then revisit whether the applicant can meet the requirement that any negative impact on fish and wildlife resources will be completely mitigated. That is your code, completely mitigated so that there is no net loss or net degradation of the resource. This can be achieved by applying the full destination resort review under 113.040 as required by the conditions of approval to the FMP and CMP. Without this process being complete, this application should be denied. We echo the requests of the tribes to keep this record open for at least 60 days so that um, the new information provided today, provided yesterday that hasn't by, been digested um, by the public, or that the county hold a new public hearing because this is important. This is 15 years 
of fighting for fish and wildlife habitat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Can you hear me? Uh, here are some jack-in-the-boxes that if you were in the community you would have heard play in 2008. The shell game is continuing. This is not a political decision and those who might weigh in from being lobbyists or being former county commissioners, that's really not the issue and it's never been the issue. The issue has been about protecting the fish and wildlife habitat as a result of this mega resort. And I encourage you to look at the images in front about fish because fish need water. And our basin management has evolved and the ecosystem is increasingly importantly being scrutinized. And Thornburg Resort began at a time when that evolution was beginning and when maybe four young steelhead were making it up to sisters. The numbers are not increasing. And the resort would draw cold groundwater for its use. And the county standard, the county code is no net loss. So the time is up on that testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're getting through the process today. Uh, at this time, uh, we do have uh, other uh, persons to testify, and I do have requests to test for testimony. At this time, is there persons in support that would like to testify? And uh, yeah, please join us. For the record, my name is Linda Swearingen, and I reside at 4022 Southwest Wickiup Court in Redmond, Oregon. I had the uh, pleasure of working with Cameron Deloshman when he originally uh, submitted his land use application, and it was successfully approved. I have not worked for the man for 14 years, so um, and I do not certainly do not work for him right now. But what I would like to do is just clarify a few things. I've worked for all but one destination resort in Central Oregon. I've worked for several counties in their mapping for destination resorts and have worked um, on several wildlife mitigation plans. I will say that Thornburg's was the first mitigation plan that included fish. And uh, uh, Thornburg is being required as a result of the appeals process to have a greater, they have to reach a greater standard than any of our other destination resorts in Deschutes County. And as you've heard, we do have a standard which is no net loss. And uh, I would challenge you to take a look at, at uh, the mitigation plans for the other resorts and you'll go oh my goodness Thornburg's is like this and the rest of the resorts mitigation plans are just a handful of pages and I will say what they were required in 2008 is very different than what they've submitted in in 2022 and just a, a comment um, about whether or not this is a shell game because they've lost water I can't answer that, but I do know one thing that's a fact. The resort market has changed dramatically over the years, and golf doesn't make sense. And so that's one of the reasons why you're seeing golf courses being either reduced in total landscaping or just being eliminated because there just isn't a market for it like there was back in uh, the early 2000s. And uh, one comment about ODFW. Like I said, I've worked on eight different resorts, and ODFW generally provides comments and reviews. It is very, very rare that they come out and approve any resort's submitted mitigation plan. 
and it, it is often the applicants, um, scientists, and their, their experts against ODFW staff that are reviewing it. And the one thing that is always short <laughs> at the end of the day is ODFW will complain, but they won't provide any facts to back up their claims. Now, the reason for that is lack of staffing and lack of money to actually hire other consultants. And so that's been problematic. If you ever believe you're going to get them to uh, a, an applicant, an ODFW, to ever shake their heads at the same time saying, we agree on everything, is not going to happen and generally what I have found is they're they're happy to take funding for one of their pet projects and um, they're happy to fund things that really may not mitigate a problem that's 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 been an issue on the ranch but if they've got a program that needs funding they'll take funding for that so um, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you very much. So you mentioned uh, first plan to include fish. Yes. Is, uh, so to my, to my knowledge. Maybe for the applicant, maybe at your testimony, but, uh, you know, is this, how did this, you know, get into the, the, the plan or why? Uh, I, I hadn't done my homework on that. Well, I think 69 appeals ago, and I, I'm guessing if. But, but it wasn't it, required or. Is that it was required, was it offered, yeah. So. Because it's never been required on the, it was never required prior to Thornburg. Thank you for the testimony. Uh, so anybody else here to speak in support at this time? If not, I've, I do have other requests to speak in opposition. I'm going to go uh, a couple names ahead, and we do have three microphones with three seats, so please come join us. So uh, Joe Craig, uh, Jane Leeson, Leesum, and Paul Lipscomb. And please state your name as you start. Uh, yes, please, just okay. you know, work your way down. Is this turned on? Okay, yeah, so Paul, so. My name's Joe Craig. I live at 2807 Northwest Shields Drive here in Bend, Oregon. Uh, I'm concerned about the pressure placed on our existing water supply and maintaining high quality water for people, wildlife, and agriculture. I asked the Schutz County to deny amending the FWMP for Thornburg Resort. Yes, lots of things have changed since 2008. And if we talk about other resort destinations, Sun River was built in the 60s. They had cedar shingle roofs and that. That's changed too. Things have changed greatly since 2008. I'm not a lawyer, but I've heard many people mention that this, their ability to get this resort built has expired. They've, they've missed deadlines and should start at the beginning. The talk around Central Oregon is about water. I don't care where you go. What was the snowpack? What is the water level in the reservoirs? What is it doing to farmers? What should we do about water? Now, they want this resort badly. They outbid the city of Bend for water rights from Brooks Resources that Brooks Resources had for the tree farm development. Why are developers allowed to go forward with this resort? The FWMP should be denied. And just, you know, four things that I look at are on January 3rd of last year, Oregon Fish and Wildlife uh, Program Manager Chandra Ferrari and Deschutes Watershed District Manager Corey Heath submitted a letter to county planners arguing that the mitigation plan approved in 2008 is based on outdated information on how groundwater withdrawals would impact fish habitat in the Deschutes River. I think everything I've heard today is, yes, that is outdated. So they have a new plan. But the resort's plan should start at the very beginning with a new application. We're in a new day and age. We have reduced snowpacks every year. It's an average of snowpacks going on. I was on the chairlifts yesterday. Every chairlift, people were mentioning, gosh, our snow level's low again this year. We have record high temperatures. We're losing water through evaporation. So I heard somebody say that we get our water from the Cascades. If we're not getting precipitation and snow, we're not getting additional water. If it's warmer, it's evaporating more water. That's just common sense. Wells are running dry. Over the past 10 years in Deschutes County, residents have deepened an average of 29 wells per year. 
Now in 2021, that went up to 60 wells a year, and in 2022, the problem was even worse. Meanwhile, development is booming with more than 1,100 new wells since 2020 alone. We're putting pressure on the water. We should not put more pressure on the water. If this proposed resort acquires new water, there will be new impacts on our water, our fish, and our wildlife. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. You're welcome. So uh, Jane and then also Mary Fleischman will be following. Uh, good morning. My name is Jane Leeson. I live at 2097 King Hezekiah here in Southeast Bend. Uh, I am here to ask that you uh, help protect our future and deny this requested amendment. Um, clearly, it is uh, an example of the cart before the horse. This organization needs to get there, um, become consistent with uh, our state and county regulations and s solidify uh, water rights before they move on to using water. We own the water. They don't. The water rights are temporary and conditional. So now is the time for you to act and protect our future here. The Deschutes River could be an even greater economic engine for our whole community. And I think we should look at the health and welfare of all the life it supports, including uh, ours, our happiness and um, joy in being in this part of the world. Um, also, I, uh, I, I hate to see public resources kind of be wasted by your time spending on this issue yet again when everybody recognizes that really uh, we are on a precipice of a water crisis, and we've got to uh, make sure they can secure that before they go forward. Those are my comments, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Mary Fleischman and then uh, Bill Littlefield. Following Bill will be Douglas Stout. Yes, my name is Mary Fleischman. <clears throat> I live at 61503 Camelot Place, Bend, Oregon. I'm here as a representative and the leader of the Central Oregon chapter of the Great Old Broads for Wilderness. We're a national grassroots nonprofit with over 40 chapters across the United States. There are four chapters in, in Oregon and six chapters, <coughs> or excuse me, eight chapters in the total Pacific Northwest. Um, and locally, we have a membership of 400. Uh, we're very much opposed um, to approval of this of this uh, appeal. We have already submitted comments, but I still have a few more comments I want to really stress. Of greatest concern is, of course, the continuing loss of groundwater, which we've been hearing a lot of today, and ongoing ch with ongoing changes in our weather, climate change. Also, concerns is the continued impacts of our natural resources, our wildlife corridors, and habitat with ongoing development of large resorts, which quite honestly do not assist in one of our other big elephants in the room, and it's affordable housing. As what was stated in our letter to you, the Broads believe there should be a master plan for land use and managed population growth in the county. As we look at a 100-year plan, such as what is happening with the location of the solid waste landfill, how are you looking at planning for open areas and wildlife corridors that will impact the health of our nat of nature? It seems to us that the county's approval of expanding Thornburg is like finding a way around urban growth boundaries. Land use planning was established to set limits to manage growth and allow wild, lands wild landscapes to function for future use, enjoyment, and the help of our region. Uh, again, we request that you deny this appeal and end this never-ending request for a permit since 2004. This process just needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bill Littlefield, uh, Doug Stout, and then following will be uh, Woody Keel or Key. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Bill Littlefield. I live at 60280 Winsong Lane in Bend in unincorporated Deschutes County. I've been a longtime resident of the area and I don't envy your position here today and your task in front of you. I would like to comment on a few things that I heard today. Um, 
One of them is that we, we heard early on about the recharging of the system and that all the water that we have in the basin is all the water that we have. What seems obvious to most of us who have been longtime residents is the amount of water that's been recharging has been dwindling. And I only have anecdotal evidence of that, but as someone uh, who lives on small farm property, I can tell you that for the last three years I've been paying for irrigation rights and not receiving water. And that's true for all the other people in my irrigation district. For 100 years, we were able to receive that water. But in the last three, the, the water situation has gotten so serious that we still receive the fees without the water. In addition to that, myself and several people in my neighborhood have had to deepen our wells. The well that, I, that was dug over 20 years ago was 880 feet deep. And we had water levels at 850. The well is now 1,000 feet deep at the cost of $25,000 to me and the water level is now at 900 feet. So while we're talking about water here primarily, we need to also think about fish and wildlife. And my concern with this resort is that it's going to take up a lot of winter range. And winter range is something in limited supply. And without the winter range, we will not have the wildlife. I think those of us who've been here a long time have appreciated the wildlife in the area. We appreciate what we're trying to do to restore the fish. And I think we need to be mindful of the current residents and the residents who have been here longer rather than worrying so much about the new residents coming in. So thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. So Woody was called up and then also Carol, Carol Macbeth. Good morning. My name is Douglas Stout. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. I live at 66245 Bar Road in Tumalo. Um, I'm representing the Ben chapter of the Oregon Hunters Association this morning and myself and my family. My family and I have lived in Tumalo since 1999. I'd like, I'd like it noted that we're tax-paying voting citizens. Um, first off, I, being an active in my community and my business, I, I personally know of three wells in my neighborhood that have gone dry just in the last couple of years. Uh, one person had, one of those had to actually drill a whole new well at a great expense because the old one couldn't be made deeper. That and the fact that I read a USGS study recently that I recall correctly, our subterranean water, our bathtub, as that gentleman put it, was down 39 feet from 1980. That's clearly indicative of the drought we're in. To grant this proposal under those conditions is ludicrous. It just can't be supported. Now, you just heard testimony from the ODF and W. I know all the three of you are intelligent enough to catch that in spite of what that man over there said, ODF and W, who is in charge of our fish and wildlife, do not concur with this plan. They, what I got from it, reading between the lines, is the applicant had not meant the burden of proof not even close. In fact, what I saw was they hadn't really provided any concrete evidence that this plan would work and provide no net loss. That's the big word. Those are your key words, no net loss to wildlife. At this time, I would like to ask, implore you to please protect our wildlife. P please protect our tax board, the best interests of our voting and tax-paying residents in Deschutes County. The habitat is so fragile. The river ecosystem is so fragile. And if this goes through, the damage, is, it's irreversible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so we had uh, Woody Key and Carol Macbeth, and following will be Bob Bud, Bud St. John. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, there you go, Carol. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Carol Macbeth, and I'm a staff attorney for Central Oregon Lamb Watch. We're a nonprofit organization here in Bend. Where our address is 2843 Northwest Lolo Drive in 97703. 
I wanted to respond to arguments that ODFW's uh, opinion in this matter is not necessary. I'm quoting from the CMP that was approved originally, the conceptual master plan. It says, applicant has agreed to develop a wildlife mitigation plan in conjunction with BLM and ODFW to compensate for adverse effects on wildlife. And it says, the mitigation plan adopted by the applicant in consultation with Tetra Tech, ODFW, and BLM shall be adopted and implemented throughout the life of the resort. So throughout the life of the resort, the plan they had in a consultation with ODFW was, was required and for the approval in the first place. And since this is still the life of the resort, that requirement is still present and whatever mitigation plan they put forward still is required to have ODFW and BLM approval so that any comment to the contrary may be safely disregarded. Um, I would like to echo others in saying that the developer's evidence that what they propose will not raise water temperatures here is misplaced at this time. Because what's, what they're saying is they're putting forward an entirely new wildlife mitigation plan, which was part of one of the most important parts of the original approval. They're changing the open space by changing the number of golf courses. They're changing, and the, and the arrangement of golf courses, and they're changing the plan. There's a huge change because G17036 no longer yields water. So when this was originally approved in 2008, they, the, your predecessors said, developer, show us how there's water available, and they handed you G17036. Now that is not proof of water. So that proof isn't there. So where there should be proof of water availability, there's a big hole. There's no evidence. So that's a substantial change in what happened. The open space is a substantial change, and this modification is a substantial change. And what the words say on the, the, the approvals from 2008, the CMP said it, and then the final master plan, the, the uh, FMP said, approval is based on the submitted plan, and any substantial change to the approved plan will require a new application. So here you have the applicant trying to show you this plan's okay. That's not the question. It's whether it's a substantial change. If it's a substantial change, everyone has to back up. And as ODFW and the tribes are saying, we need more time. We need to look at this more holistically. Well, that's what happens when you go back and do an original new application. So, so it doesn't, it's really irrelevant now whether anyone agrees with this plan. If there were evidence to support it, it doesn't matter whether it's a good plan in itself. What matters is it's a very substantial change from what was already agreed to. And the existence of a substantial change, whether good or ill, is what, what requires a new application. Then the new application for the CMP and the FMP will allow everyone as much time as they need to look at it, which is what the tribes and ODFW are both saying they need. Um, and Central Oregon Land Watch uh, is very glad for their testimony and, and echoes their concerns. If you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we had a request to speak from Bod, uh, Bob Buds, Budinson or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll have to, it got yeah, a little messy right in the middle there, so I'm not sure what it was. That's okay. <laughs> I've been called many things. <laughs> Bob, how about we start with Bob? <laughs> Bob Buddenbone. Uh, uh, I live at uh, 18665 Ennis Market Road. Uh, north of town, uh, Bend 97703. I hadn't planned to make any comments today, so I didn't really come specially prepared, so this is kind of off the, off the cuff, but it's more a reaction, partly a reaction to things I've heard today, partly a product of what I understood the process to be. Number one, uh, a few weeks back, we were talking about a wildlife plant. First of all, let me back up to, I'm here representing to, similar to Doug Stout, OHA, but also, secondly, as a landowner, farming roughly 70 acres uh, just off Ennis Market in 20. Okay, so, uh, and um, uh, in the TID uh, district. Um, a few weeks back, you had a hearing about the wildlife uh, inventory plan. Uh, point number one is, in that plan, uh, I, I've been familiarizing myself there's a whole new area that's been drawn out as, as uh, a potential for uh, con uh, tighter control over uh, wintering, mule deer wintering grounds. This resort sits right in there, okay? So it starts to ask the question, you've got a couple of things going on here uh, uh, as a product of the world changing and new information becoming available. 
So I'd ask you to take that in consideration, even though that decision hasn't been made, how to weigh that, that clearly has, is happening while this other process is unfolding. Two is uh, back when the uh, state land, I think it's a land use board, was considering a sale of 400 acres to the resort, uh, OHA weighed in, I wrote the letter with help of some others, uh, an objection to it, uh, partly on the grounds of the mule deer wintering grounds and partly on the basis of the water, uh, the impact on water resources. And because this is a de novo, or, uh, de novo hearing, I understand I could probably submit that and I will do so. Uh, I didn't have time to do it before this hearing, but I will do that in the next couple of days so you have the benefit of that letter as well. Um, third is, uh, as a landowner and a farmer, uh, this year TID cut us back about 30%, maybe 40 by some estimates. I'm struggling to farm. I've got 100-year-old rights to water. If the water's not there, I can't use it. I get it. And we struggle mightily. It's hard to imagine, really hard to imagine, that in this deteriorating situation and knowing what's happening to the south of us that's gotten so dire, they're starting to talk about bringing water in, the federal government's involved. It's really hard for me to imagine that we would take on a new demand. If anything, and no one's ever talked about this, and I'm sure there's a hundred reasons why this couldn't happen. I'd prefer seeing that well punched by TID so they can supplement the water that we get short on for the last three months or two months of our season when needed, which if things correct themselves would never be needed. Wouldn't that be cool? And these are long-standing financial interests. Having said that, I am sensitive to private property rights, and I really am. I'm a lifelong conservative, <laughs> so I am very sensitive about that too, and not, not, don't take it easy to uh, try and impair those rights. So, but I try to look at things holistically. So I would uh, leave you with that, and uh, uh, just hope that you take your time to deliberate on this, and including not making the decision today. Thank you very much for your testimony. So I have another Thank you, Bob. I mean, question. Just, just one one specific comment about that. Um, the, the relationship between the new wildlife inventory when it's completed uh, and applications, uh, you know, applications previously approved and new uh, is that the new wildlife inventory, the, the new over combined wildlife overlay zone will apply to new applications going forward, but things that have already been pr approved, uh, you know, under the old wildlife overlays, uh, the, uh, you know, my understanding is that, 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 that those uh, have, are, are grandfathered in. They, you know, the goalpost was set a certain place for those applications, and you could talk to our community development department to get more details about kind of the interaction of these two processes, but uh, that, that's my best understanding. Yeah. Fully understand, fully understand, but it is part of the world we live in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Don. So I have another blue paper uh, request to speak, and it, it just has an email address, the Kramers, if somebody wanted to speak on that. Can I go ahead and just state my name on here? Sure. Late, so I just and you know, we're still available to take a request to speak. This is the open period, so if anybody else wants to speak, uh, you know, you're available to, and we can, uh, yeah, just grab a blue page and write your name down and hand it to us. But thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, so for the record, my name is Lauren Kramer, and it's C-R-A-M-E-R. -E I live at 65965 White Rock Loop in Tumalo. Um, so when I learned of this resorts plan, I, I, at first I heard three golf courses, and there's one, and honestly, there's just not enough... Um, knowledge to the community what is going on there um, can somebody tell me how many golf courses are proposed right now or approved on this resort uh, under the original plan there was one and two optional yeah up approved. to three but so how many have been approved uh it's a conceptual master plan and a final master plan and now uh and then then the applicant would build so it's variable. So it's but not approved? But it, was, it is approved. It is approved for one or three? I'm one, hearing one, three one of us Yeah, this one and two optional. Two okay. Options. So yeah. Uh, so we're looking at 900 gallons of water a day, right? <coughs> They've actually about. cut it 
what they are bringing up today, the water. I mean, 900,000. 900, <laughs> water use. <laughs> Almost a million gallons a day. So, uh, okay. Yeah, so just to clarify this point here, um, for the record again, Caroline House, I'm a senior planner. Um, so the resort's conceptual master plan and final master plans allow them right now to build up to three um, golf courses with only one being required. They have a minimum uh, amount of money they have to invest into recreational facilities. So that's the required one. And then the two additional would be done potentially during additional phases of the resort's development. Okay. With the hearings officer's decision, they asked, or the most recent application, they're asking to agree to not to build one of the three, but still have to build that first required one. And in that change, is there any way you could uh, like add on some affordable housing into that? Um, I mean, if we can, if they can change and take off golf courses, can you add affordable housing to a luxury destination resort that really, right now, we aren't in need of in the community? Maybe what Caroline could answer is to to modify the housing within the housing units within the applications. What would be, uh, in, what would that entail? Yeah. So not, I don't want to too sidetrack, but to answer your question, there would have to be a, a code nexus to justify, say, adding affordable housing. They're entitled to build a certain number of dwelling units that's based on a ratio with overnight lodging accommodations, and all of this is tied to the original approvals. So for the board to come back and add additional conditions, there would have to be some type of connection to the code, and I'm not aware of any conditions or criteria that would be a nexus as part of this application to justify addition of affordable housing, but I haven't really looked at that particular question, so I okay. can't so completely answer Alex, it. This is three minutes of testimony. Yeah, so I'm fully engaged a whole room so full of people all here. About this, but and, I'm yeah, I don't know that we're going to be able to go much farther. And just life. testimony, please. So, um, so I have a small farm off of Klein Falls. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Caroline. Caroline. <laughs> I have a small farm off of Klein Falls Highway, close to Klein View. Most of my neighbors and I grow and raise food to eat. Due to the drought and the lack of water, the bathtub over the last couple of years we have had to cut back around 50 percent of our water rights we have for farming as you've heard from some of my neighbors on july 27th um, still talking about wildlife i contacted two county employees working um, on the thornburg resort when my neighbor and i spotted eagles on klein view on different occasions did the county contact ODFW or the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to protect these eagles? I am requesting the Thornburg Fish and Wildlife Management Plan to be updated and include an eagle study before any more clearing or construction happens. This should have been done back in July or earlier. I'm also asking the commissioners to do everything in your power to protect the residents and wildlife and to cut Thornburg's current water rights an additional 50% like the rest of us had to do. Um, and not to allow any transfers of these water rights that haven't been used. Please deny the proposed change to the Fish and Wildlife Management Plan that this developer is asking for and please choose what is right for our community and environment as a whole when any future requests come up. I'm also a conservative, but I do what's right, and this just doesn't seem right. So, and for the record, the county has heard of the surrounding wells drilling, drying up or lowering at an alarming rate. If this continues and the county doesn't put a halt to do a study, um, a halt on development and do a study, we're going to have a major problem and possible lawsuit as well. So not only is this affecting the river, basin, and wildlife, this is affecting me, my family, my neighbors, along with farms that grow food for our community. Um, and regarding the four other resorts, these were built at a different time with different circumstances. And four is, off, is, off, is too many. I golf. I can get a tea time anywhere the same day. So anyways, thank you for your time. I rambled on about, and I have so much other things to say, but I tried to stay and on target and that is about the wildlife. Thank um, you very much. You're welcome. So is there any way you could answer those questions though about the um, eagles? Did anybody contact, um, and you can even do like a records search on July 27th when I did contact the county about these eagles? What you could do is go back and take a look at that 2008 Fish and Wildlife Management Plan and see if there's anything about eagles in there. Oh, but oh. eagles is a protected species. Like it doesn't matter in 08 and 90 and 
it doesn't matter. They're protected. You don't have to go back. If you see something and we need to protect it, we can't go back to 08. We protect it now. But, but your question was, were eagles considered, you know, in, in, in developing the plans for Thornburg? And that would be the first place I would look to, to, to well, understand whether to eagles were question. considered or so, not. Uh, yeah, this, this is a public hearing on the matter. The applicant is the applicant. You're asking uh, a hearings body for a decision on this. and It's not a decision. I mean, you're, you're, trying, you're cutting right through everything we're doing here, and I want to thank you for doing what you're doing. But oh, yeah. Yeah, this isn't yeah. an interactive the right applicant now. The could you. choose to address yeah. eagles in their rebuttal at, 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 the, at the, yeah. the end of this hearing. Okay. That, okay, that, so that I just have to get more involved, I guess it sounds like. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else uh, uh, urging to testify in this matter? Please join us. Oh, no, just come join us. Uh, yeah, share your name. You can fill out a piece. Yep. Thank you. I apologize. I got here a little late. So is there a blue sheet for me to right here? There you go. After go ahead, you give go ahead and testify time. first and then do the blue sheet. You can do it afterwards. Okay. I'll do it afterwards and then give it to you guys. Okay. All right. Thanks for hearing me. I appreciate you all being here this morning. and Maybe it's afternoon already. I don't know. Um, first, I want to... A name for the record? Oh, yeah. Dirk Van Howling, 65160 Smoky Ridge Road, Bend, Oregon, 97703. Um, I want to support and agree with the Gould appeal regarding the hearings officer's acceptance of um, not requiring a new CMP. I think that the new CMP is required on this case because there are substantial changes. Um, I do agree with the hearings officer's decision regarding the FWMP and no net loss validation for that needs to be confirmed. We don't have that. <coughs> and I also, just off the cuff, want the commissioners to consider the welfare and the health of our ecosystem in 10 years from now. Not just today, because we're not in a drill. This isn't a performance. This is a real thing. We're in a crisis. We have an issue with water. Thornburg doesn't have water. And we've heard that, and I don't need to validate that. The approval and the authority given to Thornburg's unilateral modifications of the FWMP sets a, de a dangerous precedent. Are we going to now allow the developer to change their agreement from 2008 and give them the latitude and the authority to come up with their own development plan because the FWMP was a substantial part of that final master plan. You can't deny that and that's on the grounds that look what they're proposing to do. They want to take what they had previously decided they wanted to do and they've taken that and put that aside because that no longer fits their needs and now they're going to develop their own with their own experts and no collaboration from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, from ODFW, and let's read a few of the comments that their application received from the Oregon Water Resource Depart Department. And I think it's kind of interesting because a couple of these were already brought up. This is a review of a application that Thornburg presented to the Oregon Water Resource Department, and I think it's application G19139. Now, this may be dated to some extent because it was back in July, but nonetheless, I don't think things have changed from July to, from July to now. So, I'm running out on a three minute testimony. Okay. So, groundwater is not determined to be over appropriated, they're saying, but not be available within the capacity of the resource. That's for Thornburg. The department has determined based on their findings that the proposed groundwater use will have potential for substantial interference in the Deschutes River. The proposed use of hydraulically connected groundwater with the potential for sub substantial interference is not allowed in the Deschutes Basin from April 15 to September 30th. Yet Thornburg wants to change 
a agricultural water right to a quasi right. The agricultural right, you all know, would probably only be used six or seven months out of the year. The quasi right can be used for whatever they want 12 months out of the year. And when you take an in stream water right and you convert it and transfer it and do that, you've taken water from farmers. I'll, I'll drop my testimony. I don't Great, thank you. Drag it on. Thank you. Anyone else uh, wanting to testify in this matter? Okay. Yep, James Gardner, thank you. Please proceed. Um, yeah, my name is James Gardner, I live at 2662 Volcano View Way in Redmond, lived in Central Oregon, you know, more years than we want to count, but you know, 40 years or so. Um, care a lot about these issues, uh, have a deep appreciation for those of you who oversee this review process. It's a very complicated process. And um, uh, I have, uh, I've lived beside the Thornburgs for many years. I have a high regard for their history and their love of this area and this project. Um, I, I, I guess I just want to put a, a suggest respectfully that we appreciate the process. Uh, and that destination resorts are a desirable land use in this state. And one of the things I want to say, and the state says that, and they tend to get approved in the long run. Not, by the way, and I have no interest in this resort. Um, uh, but I do want to say that it's, this is the kind of review that the state needs. The highways are full of traffic. People are coming. We have growth. We'll have continued growth. We have sprawling growth. This is a carefully planned, resorts are, by their definition and by state law, a carefully planned review process. You hear from the tribes, that is essential. We hear from the community and the neighbors, uh, but we'd also, there, there also are elements we don't hear, and that is, um, you know, they're really, they're enormously important for the economy and the schools and taxes and recreational character of Central Oregon and, and individuals. Um, and, they're, and they are a desirable land use. And this, this committee has the responsibility of these commissioners of evaluating uh, the issues of water and so on. I, I don't come today to speak to that issue, but to say that the, the review of those matters and this kind of discussion is why this is a good land use form in general and I would say also I know the, I know the property and I know that, that the water uses have been cut back. That's a desirable thing. That's what you, you know, uh, apparently fewer golf courses and so on. I have no interest in golf courses, by the way, but it's, it's uh, or, gol or golfers, but that, you know, we all have our own fly fishing and, and uh, athletic things we like to do. Um, I just want to say thanks to everybody for putting the time into this and the really hard pounded uh, negotiations that go through this. But, it, but be sure if you can and will, and I know everybody is in, uh, so many people are in good faith. Um, you don't hear the whole package. The roads are gonna stay full. We're gonna continue to have traffic. If we don't make carefully planned arrangements, we will have continued sprawl and, and continued problems in housing and uh, the, our, our, our cities in Oregon and in Central Oregon are, are, are overwhelmed and uh, land use planning around destination resorts with this kind of thoughtful review that you are, are lead, taking the lead in and, and that Cameron and the Thornburgs have participated in good faith and struggling with mightily with all their hearts, I know, because I've known them for a long time. Uh, that's being done in good faith too. They're trying, and I thought it was a good mo a good measure uh, that they were cutting the number of golf golf courses and the water use. And they are, uh, I I know them, uh, and they are very sensitive to the, the ancient junipers, and they're sensitive to the region, and they love the community and they love the land. Just wanted to say that I, again. I appreciate this because. If we're not careful, these meetings get adversarial 
and entirely negative. And I think the issue isn't resorts, which are carefully planned and approved by state law. And we need to respect time, too. I respect okay. time. Okay. I, know, I know what that means. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, please join us. And thank you for getting involved. You've been uh, uh, a real good group today. Hello. Uh, is this, this one on? Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is William Larson. Uh, my address is 20200 Marsh Road. That's in Tumalo. Uh, so I have a few things that I wanted to bring up. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Commissioner Chang did an amazing job. Uh, that was fantastic calling out about the um, how the different areas how waters absorb differently and cutting junipers will not necessarily uh, contribute more ground to more groundwater now that is their expert their hydrologist expert okay and he got that wrong so in my mind that casts doubt on his entire testimony. They had a beautiful graphic, uh, you know, showing the effects of the water. Well, that was pretty graphic, but if he can't get that right, do we trust the rest of his testimony? Do we trust the reports that he wrote up? Do we trust that graphic? I know I certainly don't. And the idea that this water will be replaced, and that building a resort will actually lead to a better water situation, that's laughable. Come on. I mean, it, common sense would dictate, no, building a huge resort is not going to improve the water situation. And there may be, let's say, a, a net gain, or at least on paper. Let's, get, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say that that is true. Okay, but how deep are you drilling that well? How wide of an area is that groundwater getting drawn down? Because we've heard from plenty of people about the wells uh, going dry and having to be dug deeper. And they're saying, oh, well, it might be four inches. Well, again, that's laughable, only, only four inches for building this resort. Uh, but when you look at the areas close by, it's going to be a lot more than that. They love to use analogies. If you have a, a bathtub and you, uh, and, you, know, you suck out a bunch of water really quick, you're going to see it kind of goes down where the suction is. Yeah, that's going to be our wells. And who's going to be responsible for paying for those wells and they drop? Because it's certainly not going to be the applicant. I can tell you they're, they're going to tell everybody to take a hike. And if there's this big draw, my, one of my concerns is, what's that going to do with the, uh, the composition of the minerals in the water? Is that going to, is there going to be more um, minerals, higher count in the water? Or are we going to have to buy water softeners? Are we going to have to buy filtration systems for the wells that don't go dry? Or after we drill ours out? You know, I think that these are all really important questions that need to be considered. Uh, and furthermore, there, in the Klein Butte Recreation Area, there is a protected area for raptors. And that area that is very close to this proposed resort looks exactly the same. I doubt that the raptors can tell the difference. So anyway, uh, that's all I have to say. And thank you for taking the time to consider this. And I am very impressed by your knowledge on the subject. That is exactly what I like to see in people who represent us. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone, in, anyone else wanting to testify in the matter? I'll acknowledge we have a few more emails, uh, citizen input email, uh, three of them uh, asking urging denial of the resort's appeal. I just want to acknowledge, I know I've got several emails from people online that want to testify. As oh, well. online, okay. Yeah, so um, several callers as well as... Um, <coughs> okay, so online today. testimony today. Hello. Hello, Pam. Hi, my name is Pam Monheimer. I live at 60452 Snapshot Loop in Bend, Oregon. Um, I have been a management consultant, a biochemist, and in retirement, I am a couple classes away from a master's degree in sustainability and ornithology. Um, I moved to Bend because I love nature and wildlife. And so in 
my initial statement was going to be just to say that another water use in an already over allocated system is not ecologically compatible. Further, mule deer are already declining throughout the state, so impacting more of their habitat without substantial habitat restoration will simply create more stress. There are no two ways about it. This development will only add more stress to the ecosystems that are already stressed to the max. Okay, so then I was doing a little bit of research while people were talking, and I found an article from the Associated Press from October of last year, a water reservoir considered to be a key bellwether for the amount of water available to farmers in central Oregon is nearly empty again at the end of the irrigation season. The bulletin reports the Wikiup reservoir was just 3% full as of Tuesday. So that's mid-October. So the thing, I mean, it's the elephant in the room. The only people who have mentioned uh, climate change and drought were the people who are against this resort. Um, some of the funny things that the people in favor of this resort said, which I, I don't understand wet water versus dry water. Uh, it's kind of like show me the money, which would be show me the wet water. Um, but those beautiful uh, slideshow decks that they had, they only went to 2017. Why wasn't there more current data? A lot has changed in the environment since 2017. Uh, additionally, oh, um, he said something about 145 degrees annual rainfall with eight inches in Primeville. Um, I, I don't know, my, my husband like in retirement now works up on Mount Bachelor. We got 70 inches on Mount Bachelor this year. So I think you need more up-to-date numbers I also have to say that we don't need another golf course. We don't need another resort. We have plenty of those. We need farms, we need water to drink, and we need water to bathe. And I even am working with my homeowner association to get rid of our green lawns. We need xeriscaping. The county needs to do more to encourage people to get rid of those things that we just don't need. Lastly, I want to seriously tell um, Commissioner Chang, thank you, because I, I did do a course on um, sagebrush step. Cutting out those plants are devastating to entire ecosystems. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. Abby Kellner Rhodes. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Dear Commissioners Adair, Chang, and DeBone, my name is Abby Kellner Road. My address is 25360 Walker Road, Bend. I live at my farm, Boundless Farmstead. Please deny the proposed change to the Fish and Wildlife Management Plan for Thornburg Resort. I have testified numerous times to ask you to deny this. This is opposed by thousands of Deschutes County residents. We continue to plead with you to stop this development. The reasons become clearer each passing season. Our drought is not ending, only deepening, worsening. Crook County is in exceptional drought conditions. It's the fourth consecutive year that Crook County has declared a drought and the situation is getting worse. Deschutes is close to that same situation. Cutting down junipers will not, not solve this issue. Thornburg's water right permit expired five years ago in 2018, and as a matter of law, that water is not available to the resort. Using old 2017 USGS reports and Kelly Vache using 2016 records about Upper Deschutes Basin is not current enough, six or seven years before we had gotten into the drought situation we are in today. Please require the resort to submit a new application proving water is available under our current groundwater conditions. Thornburg is supposed to prove they have at least a 10 year permanent water supply, but we cannot predict, and they have no ability to project that far ahead. 
as climate change makes these plans absurd. If we cannot adequately provide our water needs now with our booming growth, how will we ever be able to do so if this huge playground to the second homes of the super wealthy comes in it, into existence with huge golf courses, artificial lakes, and so many multi-million dollar homes sucking the aquifer dry. Their extravagant water usage will doom us all. It is past time to readjust our priorities. We need to provide housing for all of the people in our county who are work, working here and can't afford to live here because of skyrocketing prices that are encouraged by this sort of development. They will need water too. We need to protect and encourage our farmers to grow crops we can eat. They can't afford to buy land to farm because of these kind of developments that make buying open farmland too expensive. They need water too. Our Deschutes River and all of the wildlife are suffering. They need water too. How will this affect Warm Springs tribe and their water rights, their fish and wildlife habitat? ODFW and OWRD have re reservations about this plan. What will be left for our future generations? Please try to look beyond today's profits and plan for our future. Please deny this proposed modification and require a new application. Thank you very much. Thank you for the testimony. Okay, Susan is next. Yes, hello, my name is Susan Burdick and I um, and thank you very much for allowing me uh, a few moments to give my opinion on this. As the crow flies, I'm about a mile to a mile and a half from the Thornburg Resort. Um, I live at 1900 Southwest 79th Street. In 2022, I was featured on OPB uh, <clears throat> show entitled Race to the Bottom. It was about our water. In 2021, my well went dry. Um, the county would not allow me to deepen it. I had to dig a new one which was a great financial burden on myself. Uh, <clears throat> I found the funding, uh, borrowed the money, dug the well. Um, we had all kinds of problems with it. They had to come back. That was in August of 2022. In December, they came back and dug more, bigger bill. Um, my well is now 477 feet deep. I do not have the financing available for a longer straw. Thornburg has, it seems like, lots of financing for the longest straws to draw the water out of the ground. They are, they are affecting my water table. I'm on a fixed income, and I am totally against this resort. I I am an advocate for property owners. They, sh they should be able to do within reason uh, what they want to with their land, uh, if it's within law, but not when it affects the large amount of people that this is going to affect. We simply are in a drought and pumping any more water out of that ground will affect us all no matter what their experts say. Uh, that's about all I have to say. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Jacqueline Berger, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Uh, hello, commissioners. My name is Jacqueline Berger, and I live at 3606 Southwest Badger Ave in Redmond. And I'd like to petition you to deny the proposed changes to the Fish and Wildlife Management Plan for Thornburg Resort and require them to reapply. Legally, the original approval states that if there is a substantial change from the original conditions, a new application must be submitted. And these changes, by their own testimony today, constitute a substantial change. In addition, developments relying on quasi-municipal water rights are required to have a 10-year permanent water supply plan. 
As further illustrated from today's testimony, Thornborough doesn't have the 10-year permanent water supply necessary by law and therefore is proposed. This proposed modification should be denied and a new application should be required. And in addition, during their presentation today, there was not substantial evidence presented on stated claims of oh my goodness, on benefit. And I found there to be a continued lack of information regarding how they will ensure compliance over time to the new FWMP. But besides the numerous and obvious legal reasons why Thornborough Resort should be required to reapply, I'd like to appeal to you as a fellow citizen in Central Oregon. My partner and I moved to this area a year ago, coming from a highly developed and urban sprawled area of the Midwest. We were attracted to this area because of the opportunities in farming and ranching that aren't available in many other states because of overdevelopment and depleted or contaminated waters. We also moved here for my partner, who is a veteran, to have access to abundance of public lands, wildlife, hunting, fishing, and a strong veteran community. I'll admit that since moving here, it's been very discouraging to see an increased focus on an immense amount of sprawling residential developments at high costs, resorts that are being unused, all of this over investments on our food resources and the people trying to make that work their livelihood. It's certainly weighing on our decisions to start our lives here and establish our numerous businesses here. One question that I keep asking myself that I'm not sure if it's been answered yet is, do we have any estimates on what this resort will bring to our community? We currently have five resort living communities that are constantly short on staffing, frequently hiring for folks and unable to fill positions. As a result, several of their amenities are closed and most of these communities don't contain full-time residents. If you check any real estate website, most of the houses or units available are for rent or for sale on an ongoing basis. So the people living in these communities aren't contributing to our local economy and any impactful way. So what makes Thornburgh's resort any different? People move and visit here for the open spaces, wildlife, and wildlands. So I'd like to encourage you to not let this slice of heaven turn into another wasteland where elks no longer migrate through Klein Butte, bird migratory paths are greatly altered because of the lack of juniper trees, and where farmers can no longer grow their crops or feed their animals because water is being funneled to minimally used golf courses. Everything Thornboro is promising, we already have. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Uh, phone a phone number online, 2224, if you'd like to testify in this matter. Oh, there we go. Good. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Yes. OK. Uh, my name is Susan Hart. Uh, S-U-S-A-N-H-A-R-T. I live at 20175 Marsh Road, which is just off Klein Falls, about a mile to a mile and a half from the Thornburg Resort. I've lived here for 37 years. <clears throat> um, I would like to, to ask that you would deny this application. I'm in agreement that there are substantial changes uh, to the plan. And the original plan required that if there were to be substantial changes, a new application would be required. I would also like to point out and agree with the uh, lack of evidence of a 10-year availability of water. And the chance of getting that evidence is extremely slim. Uh, first of all, uh, I also agree with the... Uh, the data that is being presented by the engineer is extraordinarily outdated. And I think that it is self-evident uh, with climate change and with a uh, lack of affordable housing that it is high time that we not look backwards for data, but we look forward into the future and plan for the future. Um, on the website, drought.gov you can look up and see what the conditions are in <clears throat> central oregon now for instance oregon itself is or i should say uh, deschutes county alone in the designations from <clears throat> do through d4 for which is from an abnormally dry to exceptional drought we are in D1 through D3, and that uh, is not as bad as Crook and Jefferson counties. 
So we are from moderate drought to extreme drought. Um, Second of all, when you look at what our current uh, situation is, uh, we have, um, we did have quite a nice uh, wet uh, December, but right now, according to this site, for the year 2022, 143,808 people in Deschutes County are affected by drought, up 34.4% since last month. 91.2% of people in Deschutes County are affected by drought, up 23% from last month. It was the 45th wettest December on record over the past 129 years, but that was still only up 0.69 0.69 inches from normal, not even an inch. And that was just for the month. That doesn't count what happened the rest of the year. It is, in fact, the 42nd driest year to date over the past 128 years. We are down 2.82 inches from normal. So all of the data that was presented by the water engineer hired by the applicant is simply worthless. And projections, everybody knows, for climate change are expected to get worse. Okay, Susan, thank you very much for your testimony. That's been three minutes. Can you wrap it up, please? Okay, I will. I did want to make one other comment about the wildlife habitat. Um, No mention was made uh, of what would happen to the wildlife that use those juniper trees if they're harvested. And the fact that that is in the uh, wildlife management zone that the uh, wildlife department is is putting out. I it will impact because for some ungodly reason they have exempted destination resorts from uh, having to do any mitigation. Okay, Susan, thank thank you very much for your testimony. All of the burden it puts all of the burden on the neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Steve Greening, Green. Steve, you're next. Please unmute. Yep. There we go. And I hope I can be heard. Yes. Yes. Um, Steve Greening, 1435 Northwest Galveston, Bend, Oregon, 97703. I came here in 1950. I watched this uh, area um, as an outdoor enthusiast. Um, fisherman, hunter, skier. And I am concerned, uh, I would like this to be denied. Uh, It seems as though the mitigation um, is not um, clear. And um, I have a concern that um, Thornburg will, um, in the area, suck an incredible amount of water from the ground. How does their mitigation replace the immediate groundwater in that area? So as I would see it, the area neighboring wells will be highly affected, probably as stated, the Crooked River and the Righteous Creek will be affected. How does the mitigation planned by Thornburg replace that area? I can imagine that many wells uh, will uh, go down uh, because of that. And this has not been um, addressed that I see um, and needs to be um, considered which would, I would say, to uh, give the 60 days as new questions uh, have arisen and um, need to be explored. And that's what I have. Great. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Cassid Family Farms, thank you for joining us. Hello, 
can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Kate Cassad. My address is 2595 Northwest Elm Lane, Madras, Oregon. Um, I very much would like to ask you to reject um, the applicant's um, application proposal. Um, and something I've learned through the process of Thornburg, which has been a hard lesson for me to learn, is that this is really about procedure. So I'm learning quite a lot about procedure. And um, it, 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 my father was actually a permit consultant. He worked with building departments and board of commissioners and landowners. And something that he taught me is that, um, you know, uh, you have to pay attention to when um, uh, the, the, the bureaucratic organizations are not following their own rules. So, you know, the legal counsel for the applicant actually really grounded us in what this is all about in the beginning. This is all about no net loss standard being met. And it appears that the hearings officer and also ODF and W um, have both decided that the burden of proof, which lies on the applicant, has not been shown that the no net loss standard is being met. Um, and I also find it curious in the past, um, when appeals have not been heard by the Board of Commissioners, I've reached out and asked, why aren't you going to hear this appeal? And I've been told by the Board of Commissioners, it's because, well, look, the um, hearings officer is the expert in this. We rely on the experts. And, if, and so we're going to follow their expert um, uh, ruling. So I, it's curious. I, I would like to understand why you all are hearing this appeal by the applicant now when the hearings officer has rendered his decision as an expert, as has ODF and W. Um, I also would like to um, point out it was significant that ODNF and W, um, they made an effort <laughs> to make this point to you all, which is that they have asked the applicant and requested certain information time and time again, and it has still not been provided. So I think it's important that they made that point to you. And finally, I want to ground us all <laughs> in something that is transpiring, which is going to affect all of us who hold water rights in the basin. The Center for Biological Diversity has filed their intent to sue this basin, saying that the habitat conservation plan that was created is not doing enough. And I am a Jefferson County farmer who's been hugely impacted by drought and, and water cutbacks. But I, I want us all to understand, it's no longer just Jefferson County or North Unit Irrigation District who's going to be under fire. COID and all of the other irrigation districts are facing a huge threat from this lawsuit from the CBD. So as a basin, we have to seriously come together on behalf of all irrigators from COID, every irrigation district, and understand that we must come together and really look at the decisions we are making because we are up against a ginormous lawsuit that threatens all of our irrigation water rights. And again, I just want to ground us in procedure. Burden of proof lies on the applicant. It has clearly not, not been shown. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, so are there any other uh, requests to speak on our Zoom call today? You, you can use the raise hand feature. Seeing none. Oh. Okay, this will be the, the final request to speak at this time then. One more, Ron. You're muted. So you thank you for joining us, Ron. If you unmute, you can testify. <clears throat> yep, okay, so we're gonna move. Oh, there we go. It was close. Okay, well, uh, yeah, so written testimony, I'm sure will be available on this if he wants to provide testimony. Is there anybody else in the room? Seeing none, at this time, uh, a rebuttal um, from applicant. It's been a long hearing, so uh, let's just take a moment and get into the final. Oh, yeah. In fact, if you yeah, if you want to request that, I'm just about ready to do that myself. So, 
unless you want to do it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> oh! <laughs> okay. I think you took a break. I took a break. Some of them have wheels and some don't. Yep, yep. <laughs> That's tricky. Some do and don't, I've don't have wheels. I've had more embarrassing things okay. happen in hearings before, so, you know, I'll take it. Um, I'll try to do our rebuttal as quickly as possible. Um, I've got a few things I want to hit, but uh, do you want to start with Jim? We only have 10 minutes. What, uh, why don't you go ahead and then... Uh, okay, I want to okay. hit a couple things first. Um, let me get to my notes on it. Um, I want to stress again that there's no new water being used. These are water rights that are currently being used that have now been purchased by Thornburg. I want to address the issue of whether or not G17036 is a valid or usable water right. Um, Ms. Bragger put on a long presentation on that, and every single one of her arguments has been explicitly rejected by the courts. So we have uh, now three Supreme Court denial of reviews on Thornburg, including the golf course, uh, OLUs, and a, uh, an additional modification. Uh, she has filed three additional petitions for review that we expect will be denied also to be heard uh, shortly. Uh, I think it would be telling to tell you that uh, the first request uh, that was filed in 2022, uh, as well as the second, were denied in something like a month. Supreme Court doesn't move that fast unless they really don't want to hear something. So I think it's important to tell you that. Um, the, the question of whether G17036 is available and usable, that's a question before OWRD under a contested case proceeding. But again, LUBA, Court of Appeals have both said it's, it's a valid existing water right for now. Um, and we're entitled to rely upon it. Uh, the Court of Appeals has also specifically rejected the notion that that particular permit is what is required for resort use or by the FWMP. Specifically rejected that. So I, I don't know why they continue to raise it. It's been specifically rejected. Um, truth is truth. Um, ODF, ODF, ODF and W. Um, I, I think the Commission was starting to ask questions about this, and Commissioner DeBone, you're right. Uh, we have an issue of what ODFNW wants water law to be and what it actually is. They're requesting, they're essentially telling Thornburg, we cannot get credit for water right mitigation if somebody is already using it in the stream. Well, I'm, I, that's not really the way water mitigation works. I know that Jim's going to talk about that more. Um, they've asked for additional information on two particular rights. We've provided gobs of information, including 22 years of history. So 60% of the water rights in the plan, we've provided every piece of information they could ever want. Uh, we have a, one of the rights that we're using is the, we call the tree farm right. Uh, that right was just certificated by Oregon Water Resources Department in 2021, which means they reviewed it. The water is there, and there's a statute that's very important and operable here, which is 537-270. And what that statute essentially says is uh, a water right certificate is conclusive evidence in any tribunal or forum uh, in the entire state. That includes land use, courts, anything, um, of availability of uh, that water right. So um, in the amount and the appropriation of that certificate, unless it's subject to cancellation. None of these rights here are subject to cancellation, nor has any been started. So uh, conclusive evidence, ORS 537270. A um, couple of other quick things. CMP is not void. Um, uh, Ms. Bragger cited a case from 2015. There's a case from 2016 where Luba says it's not void and in fact is uh, part of the FW, sorry, the FMP, the final master plan. So um, they're, they're attempting to make a procedural argument that was rejected by the hearings officer and in fact uh, there's contrary case law on it. Um, quick question about, uh, or quick comment about uh, Ms. Macbeth quoted language about the wildlife mitigation plan. Two things, that plan uh, was, quite frankly, that, that issue was rejected by the Court of Appeals and made us come back uh, and do the wildlife mitigation plan uh, for the final master plan. So we essentially deferred that. So the findings that she read there were actually uh, what was appealed to the Court of Appeals and the court said, yeah, you actually have to do your, uh, you can defer it to the final master plan and that's fine, which is what we did. Okay, so that's what we're seeking to change is the FWMP that was adopted as part of the final master plan, which was deferred, which was allowed. Um, and so there actually aren't findings in the CMP uh, that deal with this plan. 
So uh, we originally applied for a modification to the CMP and FMP, but there's actually not findings there. Um, on the question of water availability again, uh, we provided extensive briefing on this below. Uh, again, doesn't rely on a specific permit. All of the CMP findings, um, all the CMP documentation, even the water plan itself mentions that the water source will be the Deschutes Basin, Basin's regional uh, groundwater aquifer. And quite frankly, that's actually what the code requires, is for us to use a regional aquifer as well. And so it doesn't talk about a specific permit, it talks about the source of water, which is the regional aquifer. So specific permit issue is just really not an issue. <laughs> um, new application, uh, they continue to argue that we have to apply for a new CMP or FMP. Um, the, the county, is, as far as we're aware, has never required a new destination resort uh, when they're doing a modification. In fact, Eagle Crest just did one. Um, what they require is any time a property owner who has a land use permit wants to amend or modify that permit that they come in for a new land use application. Not a, not a new proposal, just a land use application to go through the process. It's exactly what we're doing here. And that's what the hearings officer determined and we concur with it. Um, I'm gonna look, pass it over to you guys now. A couple of quick things. Um, uh, Commissioner Chang, uh, you made a point about uh, 2008 versus 2022. So, and then we've had a lot of testimony uh, about the Crooked River and Wychus Creek. In 2008 mitigation plan, there was zero benefit to the Crooked River. And uh, so at 2,129 acre feet uh, under, the, uh, under the current uh, assessment of the impact to the Crooked River using that uh, 2,129 acre feet, there would be about 2.3 CFS of reduction uh, between Osborne Spring and Opal, or Osborne Canyon and Opal Spring. Under our current plan, it's about 0.34 CFS. So we're, we are providing a substantial amount of benefit into the Crooked River under the current plan where the 2008 plan had nothing. And, and the difference is about 1.75 CFS of reduction in 2008 versus the current plan. Uh, the other thing was Weiches Creek. We're, we are presently and have been since 2015 put 1.51 CFS of water uh, left at the TSI diversion point in Wychus Creek to flow down. So we've been providing benefits for the last eight years, last seven years into Wychus Creek without creating any impacts on it at all. And that's kind of an overriding theme of everything. All of the water rights that we're talking about, they're owned, they're currently not being pumped, they're left uh, in the ground, in the stream uh, to benefit uh, the watershed stream flow and thermal impacts and and yeah one, one quick thing on that that's a really important point here because the last fwmp didn't require mitigation unless and until we were pumping for a specific resort use so we were doing it as it occurred the current plan we're doing it all now go ahead jim so just to get to a few points that i think are important um carl anuda the <clears throat> one of the attorneys that spoke um apparently isn't familiar with with uh, water rights because one of the things that was that's very specific about the Deschutes Basin that was brought in by the mitigation rules is there is no new water. So if you take an existing water right and you want to change it and use it for something new, it goes away. And if, so in other words, if you take a groundwater right and you want to then pump from a new groundwater uh, site, you can, in lieu of moving it as a direct transfer, you can cancel that and that is credited towards the new groundwater issuance. That groundwater can't be picked up casually by someone else. You can't apply for a new water right because any other person that applies for a new water right would then be requested and required to provide their own mitigation. And that could be either surface water flow or taking another groundwater right that is active, usable, and qualified that and um, cancel that in lieu of, of the new use. So Mr. Anuda's a very far off base and, and there were several comments that kind of came along with that and a big piece of that is kind of that shell game everybody talks about oh, you're just it's a shell game you're moving around here's the deal it is a shell game it absolutely is the catch is is there's a nice shiny blue ball underneath every single 
shell. And as you slide them around the table and you take the one use from one spot and move it to this spot and move one back, when you open it up, all that water is still there. You don't get a new use. All of water rights for new uses without mitigation, meaning a new use without alleviating an old use, is not allowed and hasn't been for almost 20 years in this basin. So that's really important. That is seemingly very missed amongst everyone, including legal counsel, that has testified today. <clears throat> um, so you, you can't just give it up and then somebody else can pick it up. Um, another piece too, someone referenced um, there's no, there was no accommodation for fire flow. That, that's not true. I, I was one of, one of the consultants that met with the Redmond Fire District and we talked about um, fire flow requirements, which is also why some of, there's wells that have high capacity and there's um, available tank storage in, in, in the millions of gallons to be able to meet fire flow requirements. So we're winding down on time, but yeah, let's finish up some thoughts. Yeah. And the last one is just on, uh, just a quick point on water rights. Um, someone again, you know, said that water rights are temporary and conditional. Um, water rights aren't temporary unless it's a limited license. That's the only sort of water right that's, that's temporary. A water right is a water right. So once you're issued that permit, you have the choice to develop it or not. And if you don't, sure, it'll go away. As long as you develop it and you're diligent in it, you get a water right and then you get a certificate. And that certificate is a forever water right as long as you follow the conditions. Just, just like renewing your driver's license. You either a, a good citizen and a steward of that water right or not. And if you're not, it could be taken away. But as long as you meet the conditions, you get to keep it. It's forever once it's certificated, as long as you meet the conditions. Thank you. One, one very quick thing. Um, comments about whether uh, other people, other resorts having fish plans. Uh, testimony that there, nobody else had to do a fish plan. And uh, Ms. Swaringen said prior. Well, it's not just prior, it's since. Caldera, uh, their expansion didn't, uh, didn't address that. Pronghorn, four years ago, they lost their agreement with the city of Bend for their golf course water. They had to apply for a new permit. They drilled new wells. Um, it's a substantial change. Their CMP, FMP had city of Bend water. They changed that to groundwater wells. ODFW didn't, didn't weigh in, didn't make a comment. Ms. Gould didn't weigh in and didn't make a comment uh, at that. So there's a whole bunch of change that's occurred that uh, other resorts don't get held to the standard. It's, it's Thornburg that get held, gets held to the standard. I don't have anything to add. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the uh, conclusion of our process uh, with all the testimony. Uh, at this time, we'll have staff closing comments possibly and any other questions or content that we want to review. And then we'll talk about uh, an open record period possibly. Yeah, I don't have any closing comments, um, but obviously I just want to make all three commissioners aware that, you know, if there's anything that you want staff to research, if there's an open record period, I'm happy um, and my colleagues are happy for us to provide that information to you. Any questions? So you do, I would like to confirm that Pronghorn changed their water system and didn't have to do the fish involved with that. And that was with a, a what, four years ago? So if you can just confirm, I'll confirm that for us, Carolyn? Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, if we're, if, we're poking, if we're poking at this fish and wildlife management plan requirement, I guess I'd like to ask whether it has been called a fish and wildlife management plan um, for the duration of uh, you know the issuance of these of these permits, and it was called a fish and wildlife management plan for all of these destination resorts, but there was no fish component. Um, uh, why there wasn't a fish component? Um, because it's it's a, it's called a fish and you know, at least right now what we're looking at is called a fish and wildlife management plan. Um, so that, that, that's one question I have. I, I, um, uh, I'm not sure if staff is going to be able to kind of parse this out for us, but I am, I'm still pretty unclear about uh, how wet the water that we're talking about is. Um, it, it, you've, uh, people have said a, a, a whole variety of things about uh, the water that is being offered up as, as mitigation water, and uh, I am 
but you know, I did the. It, it just I, I don't have a clear picture from all of the testimony that we heard today about whether the water that is uh, is going to be offered up as mitigation is currently water that is that is being uh, used on a regular basis um, you know and and you know essentially whether that's water that's being extracted from the ground or taken out of a stream right now. Uh, and whether that would have meaning, meaningful benefit or impact for um, for fish and wildlife habitat uh, if it was provided as mitigation water. So to the extent that you can figure out, yeah. you know, you know how much uh, how much that water is being used, um, and um, you know how much of it, you know, the quantity and the the, the frequency or the, the the timing of the use. Um, that would be helpful to understand as well. All right, I'll do my best on the second one. I do want to go back to your first question. So you're asking for research or um, a memo specific to the other destination resorts um, mitigation plans, whether they had a fish and wildlife management plan. Well, it sounds like it sounds like they Name they it. all had yeah. they all had plans, but if uh, were they not called fish and wildlife management plans back in the day? Um, because to call something a fish and wildlife management plan and not to have any fish component uh, seems problematic to me. Um, and, and so, I mean, we're, we're hearing an argument that, you know, we shouldn't be held to this standard because other people weren't. Um, but if we called it, if we've been calling it a fish and wildlife management plan from the beginning, then everybody should have been held to this standard. Okay. I'll research that and prepare a memo. And these questions can be acknowledged by anybody in a written record period, too. So, I mean, that, you know, we're, we'll see where we all go with this. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be just Carolyn's research on this. So uh, at this time, uh, it would, it's up to us as a board to kind of uh, get to the next steps of continue a hearing or close the oral portion of the hearing. Uh, and. I support closing the oral portion and go into written portions at this time. Any thoughts? That makes sense. And I see that uh, we must take final action on March 12th, so I'm sure legal is going to have some mm. valuable input for us. Okay, so that, yeah, that kind of uh, puts our... Since there's, what, 28 days in February Publishing this date year? on this, okay. Yeah, so um, when we're so talking we'll about open record period, we'll need to decide if the um, applicant, for example, would want to provide time to extend the clock to account for the open record period or not? 150 day clock. Correct. And, and we are dependent upon the applicant to provide that, uh, provide the flexibility to have a 60 day additional written comment period. Correct. Otherwise, um, we would not meet our statutory deadline. <coughs> uh, okay. So there's support for closing the oral portion of this. I, I mean, I. Uh, I, I want to I want to go back to the the request from the Confederated Tribes um, for uh, you know 60 days of additional consultation and I'm not I didn't hear from them specifically whether they would like to be able to come back with oral oral testimony or not um, if they if they would then um, closing the oral portion and leaving it only to written is is you know essentially denying the request. Uh, so, yeah, maybe legal can help on this a little bit. So, I mean, if we keep an oral portion open, what does that look like? Would we kind of open it up for any testimony, or are we asking for – can we ask for a specific testimony? I, I hadn't really done that before. So, if, uh, there's rules on continuances in our code. So, the board could continue the hearing to a date and time certain. So, you would need to pick out a hearing date, 60 days, if that was the time that you wanted to provide, to allow for the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs to come back and provide additional – um, oral testimony um, at that 60-day mark or around that 60-day mark. Could we make it for just a specific testimony, applicant, appellant, and, you know, that specific agency or uh, well, that's kind of <coughs> Stephanie know, Marshall, how, how Assistant Legal Counsel. Um, I don't see that the code drills down uh, to that level of, like, we're only going to leave the record open for one participant, you know, to come in and present more oral testimony. So I would advise that that not be the direction that the board takes if, um, but you know, I mean, 
really the biggest question is the statutory deadline. So I think that that needs to be resolved first before we consider, or excuse me, before the board considers um, continuing oral testimony to a specified date and time. <coughs> but I heard 30 days mentions and that 60 would be better, so I'm not going right to that 60 to start with. I, uh, I mean, the, the first order question is whether we have, we can work past the 150 days. Uh, so yeah, uh, so then we, we're talking, what, what was the date, March? March 12th is the 12th. day, the 150 day. Uh, so then working, that would be a published, pub published decision. So we would back away, uh, back up from that a little bit. Um, yeah, okay. <coughs> well, and uh, please participate a little bit on, on, the, on the merits of this decision, not the content of the application. So. Yeah, I'll let Ken address it first and then I'll chime in. <coughs> to, to be fair, I think we should ask Ms. Bragger up in case she's got oh, additional yeah. questions. Is it say, yeah, yeah, we're just talking about so. dates and times here right now. <laughs> so, so all I would say is under state law, the board has until March 12th to make its decision and then it has an additional two weeks to put that decision into writing. Okay, okay. Um, so. However, um, you know, we haven't really even talked about what a record would look like um, and I don't even know if you know, what the applicant's willing to do right now. So um, if the specific was request is 30 days, um, I, I don't want to um, be dismissive to the tribe because we certainly want to get them on board. That said, um, as they've acknowledged, they're coming late to the party um, and uh, this application was highly publicized since August. And so we were thinking that, you know, a couple of weeks might be reasonable. Um, and during that time, we'll, we would continue to meet with ODFW and the tribe. Um, and maybe, and we've done this in a previous hearing, uh, maybe we could uh, potentially uh, make a written request to staff to continue an open record period if um, there was movement there. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that there's appetite with with the board. Um, obviously, we would provide toll associated with that, but I have to confirm that with my client. <laughs> so uh, my understanding though is, is that we were, we were planning on having a standard 777 record yep. period that would give the board time to deliberate and make a decision by the 12th. Um, so uh, with that information, and as I say, this is just the logistics of this, this time period we're working on here, uh, and working in the concept of a good faith process, uh, you know, maybe we start off with a two-week uh, record period and a possible, you know, request for extension with, uh, you know, communication happening within that two weeks, uh, and then go from there. So that's 14. So we'll, so 14, we'll wait 14. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So add 12, 14 on the 12th of March. But as I say, I mean, if there's engagement and discussion and there's any requests, we can be flexible. It would be helpful to have more clarity about what is actually happening in terms of like a 777 because you're talking about again going into a black box with the tribes and the applicant that my client is not represented in and you've had enough litigation about this so uh, let's look at the whole uh, gamut of, of what's typically done when new information is coming forward. And I mean, I absolutely want to respect process here because we, we all, nobody wants to, and no, that's, I'm just trying you know, that's to how we got to efficient. a de novo hearing again. It's like, it's like make, make sure we don't have this opportunity of discussing, you know, what was in and what was out. So that's why this is de novo. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, at this point, as I say, uh, we're already talking about a 14 day period which would be open for any information, it looks like. Yeah, so all I, all I want to say is to, to, to clarify, we're, we're willing to waive an additional seven days. We would have already had to waive the seven days for the open record period, so that's a total of 14 days, okay? Um, and that's what we're willing to do at this point. Well, we don't have to waive the seven, the seven. There's time. Yeah, this is time just. The record for the seven, seven, seven Correct, right there's now. time, yes. We're adding, we're, we're taking it from March 12th to March 19th. Allow a okay. Period. Now I understand. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, trying to well, do this on the fly. Yeah. Hard. So, so can I clarify? A few yes, things? please. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we want to so say procedural here too. <laughs> for a typical 777, the applicant only has to extend the first 14 days because the final seven under statutory requirements does not count towards the 150. So what Mr. Okay. Delashment just said is that to accommodate, or what I believe 
he's getting to is that for a 14-day initial open record period, he's willing to waive seven of those days to give a second week of time, is what I believe is what yes. you've yeah. articulated. Which, which rolls over to the 20th of March at this point in time. Right. To make an oral decision. And it's, 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 it's not the 12th of March because that falls on a Sunday. So you, you know, prior to that seven-day extension, you would have had until the 13th. So now it would be the 20th. So then getting back to the President. tribe's request, uh, you know, trying to be involved here in, uh, you know, good faith. Um, you know, as a request for 30 days, we're talking about opening up uh, for two weeks. It's a written record period. And then uh, this is written information that will go in the public record. Everybody will be able to see it. Uh, so who who would be able to ask for that to be extended, I guess? Because it was a 30-day request. Commissioner Chang was thinking, oh, 60 sounds great. Well, it would be the applicant's position that the applicant owns the, the clock. Yeah, well, that's what and I'm so, going to make sure so we, we all know that. To make a written yep. request. And given that we're looking at a 14-day open record period now, I think we could commit to doing that in, I don't know, day 12 out of 14 or something of that nature, what would work best for staff. Is that reasonable? Um, if there is a request to, to continue f beyond that point by the applicant. Yes, sir. So it would be just referring yeah, to the, the authority of the time. The oh, time. Yeah, the 13th. So wait, I guess wait. we'd have to do it the No, 10th. I guess no, no, the 20th is a holiday. Sorry. Correct. Yeah, so that, that would be fine. Having it the 12th day be the day to request a continuance of the initial open record period is what I'm hearing, Ken, would be something if, if that support. comes to pass. And we will certainly notify staff if that's not coming also. And yes, yeah, so then respecting procedure. Ms. Breger, do you have thoughts on that? Can you just review the dates, Caroline, again? <coughs> okay, so the uh, if we're going with the 1477, the f deadline for the in initial new evidence and testimony would be February 15th. Rebuttal would be uh, February 22nd. And then final legal argument by the applicant only would be March 1st. In addition to that, um, parties could file requests for a continuance of the initial um, new evidence and testimony period, but that would need to be submitted to the county no later than Monday, February 12th. You said parties. Is but it's, it the only uh, of the applicant? Monday is the 13th. Right. <coughs> 13th. Yeah, I wrote that yeah. wrong. My colleague got the 13th. Yeah. Thank you for that correction. Who can request that extension? I would assume anyone, but it would be up to the applicant to grant uh, the time Okay, so needed. anybody could ask, and it would still be the applicant's clock. So that would give them two days to decide yep. okay. whether or not to yeah, offer that extension. And then it would be the board really making the decision on whether to um, send out a new order for the continuance. Okay. Any thoughts on that? Um, it seems awfully um, tight and unclear if, um, I think if the applicant could decide by February 14th to, to respond to a request on the that's made on the 13th to keep that record open, then we'd all be able to deal with that. And we're doing this because of the, the land use system's 150-day clock right. window. I mean, this is trying to work within a definition of a response time. Any applicant has the right to get that decision within that period of time. So it is the applicant's dis decision to allow for more time. Mr. Chang, any thoughts? Uh, we, we have to work with uh, what the applicant yeah, is willing good. to do. <coughs> Very good. So 14, 7, and 7. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? <Oof. laughs> it's okay. I fell off my chair earlier. I know. <laughs> you did that for all of us, I guess, right now. Yes. <laughs> so that means uh, what we're talking about, if not everybody's following it, is a Open record period. Anybody can provide anything on the record. In fact, yeah, Carolyn will do this too. But my understanding, everything can be added to the written record in the next two-week period of time, and we just negotiated if that might extend. And then after that, it's responding to any of that new information in the record, and then it's the applicant's final uh, uh, information on the record in response to everything that's been put in the record. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 
Um, yes. So you, you can make it more official there. You no, know, Commissioner, when you got it exactly right. So um, the first period, again, the deadline will be February 15th. That's for new evidence and testimony. So more information can be provided. Any information that you want to submit can be submitted in writing. Please provide that to me, to my attention. My, again, my name is Caroline House, and my email is my first and last name, caroline.house at deschutes.org. After the first two weeks, there's now a rebuttal period. So that's responsive evidence, as Commissioner Devone just said. So um, no new information, just responses to existing materials in the record. And the final um, deadline will be for the applicant's final legal argument, and that will be on March 1st. And um, each of those deadlines will be 4 p.m. And it's important to note that any electronic submittals that come in need to be received by our, our servers by 4 p.m. So we've had issues in the past where people have waited to the last minute and we haven't received it in time and we have to abide by that. Our business hours, which are 4 p.m. is the cutoff. And the only other thing to note is that um, the county does not retrieve materials from a website or a cloud storage service. So please provide um, any electronic submittals as PDFs or submit um, written um, materials, uh, paper copies. We uh, take that as well. Okay, with that, I think the procedure is completed for today. For today, so thank you everybody for joining us and uh, stay tuned. And let's take a five-minute break. Five minutes. At least stand up. I was going to say if we take a five-minute.
Okay, we're back after a five-minute break, uh, trying to get to the next agenda items, and maybe we'll change the agenda around a little bit, too, so we'll see where we go. Um, item number six, adult parole and probation expansion project. A change order. And as I say, thanks for standing by with us today. Good morning, Commissioners. Lee Randall, uh, Facilities Director. And I'll let this gentleman introduce himself. Um, Sergeant Blair Barker, Deschutes County Sheriff's Office. Captain Paul Garrison, Deschutes County Sheriff's Office. Hello. So before you today is uh, a change order related to a wellness and fitness center remodel. Um, it, the footprint is in the current uh, work center area, which is a shared building with the adult pro and probation building. Um, the, uh, to give just a little bit of background, uh, we've been working on the subject of a sheriff's office training and fitness area uh, going actually back to 2007 when we had some plans at the time. Moving forward, uh, we think we finally have an area that's within the footprint of, the exist of an existing building that can help uh, meet the needs of the wellness and health of the force initiatives of the sheriff's office. And uh, so I'm happy to discuss more details of the project specifically. Um, currently, uh, Skanska Building USA is on site uh, doing the expansion uh, portion of the project, and this work uh, is proposed to be carried out by them as a continuation in, in addition to their current scope of work. Um, but Sergeant Barkich is here, uh, as well as Captain Garrison, to talk about any, um, any information you'd be interested in related to the program. Yeah, so the memo talks about uh, kind of the specifics of the, uh, the contract, but yeah, tell me about the location. So this is at the work center building? Yeah, the location will be in dorm D of the work center, so we'll have easy access for all of our employees that won't interfere with any of the inmate movement. And then moves, so it's kind of two pairs of uh, uh, the, the uh, work center dorm rooms, right? Is that's kind of how it was originally set up? It's, it's evolved over time now too, I think. Yeah, and that, that's correct. Um, it'll affect two dorm rooms. Essentially, uh, we needed to create an egress pathway for inmates to the secure rec yard. So we take some of that space from uh, dorm C, and then dorm D itself uh, will be the staff uh, fitness and wellness area. And the scope includes an office, uh, a large open area, and then two uh, single occupancy shower rooms. Um, and then uh, creating uh, staff access um, from the outside of the building that's completely separated and isolated from uh, from the inmate area. And that work center dorm, the other side of the building down there, that's going to be utilized as work center in the near term or the long term? Correct. I'll let you. So in, yeah, in the near term, it's still going to be used for the same purposes. In the long term, I believe the, the campus plan is for those beds to eventually move over to the main jail. So that uh, fitness facility would be able to remain there for years to come. Yep, okay. Any other thoughts or questions? So, so it's being paid for with a transfer from the Sheriff's Office Fund? Correct. Okay. Because yep. it's, um, it's a lot of money on top of the original contract, et cetera, but they, they've they wanted to do this, what, you said since 2007? Mm -hmm. and, and the Sheriff's Office had budgeted for this project in, in this year's budget. And when's it supposed to get finished then? So we think it'll be a pretty quick build time. Uh, we're currently um, in the final review at the City of Bend. We expect to have the permit in three to five weeks uh, and have uh, the contractor be able to continue the work. Um, it'll overlap with the current project, um, and uh, we'll have some overlap, which will help be a cost savings, uh, and they'll be able to move right into this remodel project. Uh, I think we're projecting a, about a four-month uh, construction time period, uh, which would put us to um, sometime mid-summer, um, mid to late summer, to be able to occupy the space. Okay. Thanks, Lee. I'm sorry to have missed those first couple of minutes. Um, just so I am clear on, on what's going on here, uh, we have the adult parole and probation project moving with Skanska over here. We have the sheriff's office that has a need that they've had for a long time, and they have dollars. And we're just basically, we've, we suddenly see within the Skanska work in that area an opportunity to implement an additional project. And 
and we're just adding that. Correct, and it's the same building footprint, uh, just another portion. And, uh, yeah, I have no concerns about that. So is there a motion? Uh, moved um, approval of a chair's signature of document number 2023-130, the change order to the adult prob parole and probation expansion project contract with Sanska USA Building Incorporated for the Work Center Wellness Area Remodel. Low voltage cabling upgrades and HVAC equipment replacement. It explains it all right there. Yes. Second. Any other discussion? Uh, seeing none, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And chair votes yes. Thanks for standing by today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I guess the one other thing I'd say is it's great that everybody can be nimble and take advantage of opportunities when they arise. Mm hmm. Thanks. Thank you. And I did hear you were giving lots of tickets coming in on the Highway 20 this morning. So thank goodness I came in early. It wasn't me, Commissioner. I know, oh, I know. I was glad you were here. Yeah. But that's what I was hearing. <laughs> yeah, they have it down to 35, like the whole way. Uh oh. So, uh, yeah, so as I say, we started early this morning and we, yeah, we're way behind schedule. Um, I saw Joe here. So is uh, Kevin Moriarty going to be coming for these other items? For I saw Joe. Uh, I saw Kevin out in the hallway, too somewhere so uh, maybe I'm proposing that we go through the next three items and then put off discretionary grants just for a different meeting even um, you know we, we can get to it next week okay well I mean yeah we'll we'll look for an opportunity for us to do it and just one of the items we could drop today uh, well let's jump to item number nine they're sitting there ready to go and then they'll have to finish up the day here so Yep. Do we have an executive session? And we may, yeah. We so we're going to jump to item number nine and then get right back to these other two items. So, so uh, authorization to apply for a grant. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Ann Kilty. I am a manager of the Clinical and Family Services Division of uh, Public Health. And I'm here today to request authorization to apply for a grant um, through um, a partnership with OHSU and OCHIN um, that will include the PCC, the Perinatal Care Coordinator Program. Um, the purpose of this grant is to um, look at some new outcomes with an intervention of a postpartum perinatal care coordinator um, to see if we can improve um, outcomes, health outcomes for moms and babies here in Deschutes County. We were approached. Go ahead. You, explain, you said OCHIN is in there, and I think OCHIN is a software or database. So, so they're the collaborative that we work with in terms of our health technology, and they also have a research arm. Oh. Um, and so part of this um, project will involve um, some uh, interventions in terms of how to improve um, referrals and documentation, how we can streamline this, um, and see if we can make a model that not only benefits Deschutes County, but also they're hoping this could could move nationally. And we, we've been recognized here locally in the state as, as, as a really great program that is actually we found out yesterday that Clackamas County is going to expand and use our model. And um, so. Yeah, so it, it'll be kind of built, baked into the data. Yes. For good practices yep. and projects. Exactly. Oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, wonderful. So this is applying for a grant kind of a yes. big big multi-year deal six years the first year being a planning year and then five years of the actual study and we're the co-applicant so yeah Pecori is the actual applicant for the grant um, I think OHSU is oh, it's a okay. PCORI grant yeah, yeah. and so we would be a sub-recipient and OHSU would be m mostly running the study but we would be the intervention we would be the the, the group they were studying so it's up to a $21 million grant. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much of that is actually coming to Deschutes County for their our part in this? That's great. So um, part of the planning year is to really fine tune. But what we've come up with so far is um, around 2.5 would come where we would be hiring a limited duration postpartum uh, perinatal care coordinator for the duration of the grant and a, an administrative person to help with that also. And then there would be some of my time as the principal um, investigator here as the local person to Shoots County and then the supervisor for that team and then the indirect costs and materials and services. 
So 2.5 for the five or six year. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, so this is uh, yeah, authorization to apply. So starting the big project, if we uh, apply for it, and then we'll find out if we get it. And then, uh, it, you know, it boils down to, yeah, the staffing, the positions, and, the, you know, how much general fund to support these efforts, too. So, but that's future year discussions if it ever comes around. Right, yeah. And this particular, um, what would likely come back is they're the applicant and they would then want to subcontract with us to provide the services and receive portions of the grant funds that they receive if they're funded. So that's when we'll be coming back with a request to add the FTE if that's what the board chooses to support. Yeah. Um, and in terms of this particular project, we've worked to try to cover as much of the cost as possible through the actual grant dollars. This happens to be associated with one of our programs that is revenue generating and is soon to be rev revenue generating with an enhanced rate, sort of like CCBHC. More to come on that as we go through our budget <coughs> process. Um, but that revenue will help cover some of the uncovered costs by the grants. So this is one that we hope doesn't further draw on county general fund resources. Well, we want to make the right investment, but it's always hard when there's so many pulls to it now. So how many pregnancy-related deaths are there in Oregon a I year? I don't know, but I can find out and get back to you. Well, they said 80% of them are preventable, but I believe Oregon and Connecticut are the two, the two states in the nation with the lowest um, birth rates. I, I think that's kind of fascinating that we are at, we are the lowest. One of the lowest. Let's see, a low birth rate and, and declining population. Right. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't know the 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 death numbers. I do know that there's a lot of morbidity and mortality. You know, we worry about the morbidity that can go along with pregnancy, preeclampsia, diabetes, um, things that impact women's health, and then the health of their their babies. I mean, I was just was wondering how many. Yeah, I can find out and get back to you, Commissioner. Related questions. So, Commissioner Adair asked, you know, kind of like statewide, mm -hmm. you know, how how big of a problem is is maternal more mortality and morbidity for Deschutes County? Like, can you give us a feel for, you know, is this a? Um, in terms of mortality, of I don't think we're very high. Again, I can get those numbers. Um, morbidity, we have a lot of morbidity. I mean. The reason the perinatal care coordinator program came about was in 2016. There was um, focus put on the maternal morbidity and outcomes um, here in Deschutes County and in the region. So I think the perinatal care team has worked hard to address that, getting people into early OB care, getting them into primary care, other services to help address that. Um, I don't have the exact statistics on that, but I can definitely get back to all of you with those. Yeah. You, so is there a motion for authorization to apply? Yeah, I move to authorize staff to apply for a grant from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute to address health systems factors and social determinants of maternal health. I'll second it. Any other discussion? Uh, seeing none, Commissioner Chang? Yes. Commissioner Dare? Yes. And Chair votes yes. I'm sure we'll learn more. We'll learn more. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Yep. Okay, back to items number seven and eight. So item number seven, 2022 annual report for the prescribed burn, fire, smoke, and public health community response plan. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, for the record, my name is Kevin Moriarty. I'm the county forester for Deschutes County. Um, I believe the first item we were talking about was the annual report. Um, this is only for information purposes. Uh, we uh, will be submitting the 2022 uh, community response plan for prescribed fire, smoke, and public health. Um, uh, this actually is due, uh, I believe, today. Um, but we do have a little grace with that as far as uh, turning in the report. Um, I think uh, I could just provide an overview of the report if you'd like and then open it up if you have any questions. Um, so uh, first off, this report is 
provided to meet the requirements of OAR 629-048-0180 in order to maintain the exemption from the one hour air quality threshold in the Oregon Smoke Management Plan granted on December 7, 2019 for the Bend Smoke sen Sensitive Receptor Area. Um, and then essentially there's four criteria um, within the report. Um, and if you go down a little bit on the first page, it shows that. Uh, the first is compliance with requirements of, of the aforementioned uh, bill. Uh, and that involves um, essentially having a community response plan, which is what we're going to submit, and then also having a mechanism to provide notifications um, and information on prescribed fire and wildfire within, within the smoke receptive sensitive area. Uh, the second is a summary uh, used to communicate to the public and vulnerable populations. The third is log dates and times. The community initiated the response plan, and the fourth is a record of local meetings uh, to discuss the update of the community response plan. So on the first one, the compliance of requirements, the, the main thing that we have is the Central Oregon Fire website, and that's what we utilize to provide notifications to people about prescribed fire and wildfire. Um, we also use uh, social media to, to post some of those uh, items. Um, and then the other part of that is the, com the community response plan itself. So that's what we'll be um, submitting after this. The second part is kind of how we have um, a summary of methods we've used to communicate with the public and vulnerable populations. Um, if you see on page two, there's basically a, a, a set of deliverables that we've done this year. Um, and I can list those briefly. The one thing we've done is update and changes to the wireframes of the Central Oregon Fire website. Uh, the second is we provided three PSAs um, regarding smoke and, and wildfire, uh, one in Spanish and two in English. And then we also provided four posters. Um, we had an email outreach campaign and social media posts as well. And as far as the social media posts, something to, to notice, um, that we, with our text alerts, um, we had uh, a 4,000 uh, person increase in the last 12 months to receive text alerts. So now it's at 15,661. So it is catching on to receive those text alerts for, for smoke impacts. Um, and then also uh, Twitter followers, we have a pretty substantial amount of Twitter followers at 17,176. So that's pretty good to for people to follow that information as well. Um, the uh, log dates are also in there as well. Um, and that's basically logging the times uh, that the Forest Service or any entity uh, conducts prescribed fire. And then we, uh, it shows as well that we post that on the Central Oregon Fire website. Uh, we do uh, issue press releases and then issue text alerts. I think some of the, the pertinent information in regards to prescribed fire in particular this year is that we had that pause after May 20th for prescribed fire uh, with the federal government. And they, so they didn't conduct any prescribed fire from there going into summer. So there was probably a less amount of prescribed fire acres that was burned this year than may have happened previously. Um, and in, in addition to that, the uh, West Bend project, there was no prescribed fire done in the West Bend project in 2022. And we also did not have any intrusions to report for 2022. Um, and then the, the last piece uh, is essentially a record of the meetings. Um, I think in, in years past, uh, we have convened uh, stakeholders uh, in the fall to for after prescribed fire season to kind of see how things went. Um, that meeting did not happen this year um, because we did not have a, a county forester in, in that position during that time. Um, but we have convened stakeholders uh, after that and have kind of got up to speed with uh, some of the issues and some of, some of the things we're gonna carry forward uh, with that, with our response plan. Um, so that's just a general overview of the response plan, and I, I'll open it up to questions if you have any questions. 
I guess I would just say um, I, I'm really glad that we put this report together that documents so thoroughly how we are uh, connecting with people who are concerned about smoke and communicating uh, real-time information to them. Uh, I'm going to be uh, going into D.C. next week, and when I have a chance to talk to Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden about about prescribed fire smoke, uh, uh, it's going to be great to be able to wave this report at them and say, you know, we are doing things in our community to ensure that when we have smoke in the air from prescribed fire, we're protecting people's public health. Um, my, uh, I, I guess one question I, I have is, um, and it's not within the scope of this report, and, and, and it's not a requirement, but um, it sounds like we're doing a great job of communicating um, with our with our community, and I would love to know whether we have any indication that that is actually having an impact on health outcomes, right? You know, like, do, are there people who are uh, using these systems who are are, are saying, like, wow, you know, knowing that there was going to be smoke that day, I stayed inside, and you know, I didn't have an asthma attack or or, or something like that. Um, you know, even just anecdotal information. Uh, and I, I saw that Sarah is, is joining us virtually. I don't know whether um, whether the public health side has any any kind of qualitative or anecdotal um, or other other way to, to, to know whether all of the work we're doing on communicating about smoke in the air is is actually having a, an impact in terms of health benefits. Yeah. Um, Sarah, would you like to respond to that or um, I can respond? Sure, I'll do my best. Thanks, thanks Kevin, <clears throat> and thank you for the question, Commissioner Chang. I'm Sarah Worthington. Um, Climate and Health Coordinator with Deschutes County Public <clears throat> Health, and I've been supporting the efforts to uh, communicate with our community members, um, working with Eric Brion um, to really uh, align our messaging in conjunction with prescribed burns, um, as well as wildfire smoke that creeps into the area. And um, you bring up a great question, Commissioner Chang, which is we really don't have a great understanding yet as to, um, I think, Part of the problem is we don't have necessarily the best baseline data of how smoke has impacted um, people with underlying respiratory conditions um, or chronic conditions, um, asthma um, in the past. So it, so one of the things that um, I've been working on is compiling some um, understanding of whether we are seeing any increase in urgent care visits or emergency room visits that, uh, that are take place during um, smoke intrusions from prescribed burns or wildfire smoke events, which are notably um, have a much greater uh, smoke impact than a prescribed burn, which typically results in um, kind of an increase in smoke between the hours of, say, 12 and 6 a.m., and then kind of it dissipates throughout the day, whereas we all know with wildfire smoke, we can see those, um, you know, those AQI numbers in extremely unhealthy levels for days or weeks on end. So, um, more to come. We're really trying to get a better understanding of, of both kind of baseline health impacts of smoke, as well as how our efforts to increase our community resilience through this communication, through messaging, and also through distributing um, residential air purifiers and setting up clean air shelters. All of that is um, work that's really, we're just beginning to get an understanding of, of how impactful it is. No, I, I I know that that was a lot to to hope or ask for, but you know, just knowing that we are in touch with so many people, getting them in, important information in a timely fashion, it it I, I just can't help but think it's having benefits for people's health. Yeah, I, th I think within the uh, the stakeholder group for uh, smoke management, you know, we've we've talked about trying to get more data. I think is probably one of the one thing one of the main things that can really improve uh, knowing what the impacts are to our community, um, whether that's more nephilometers or getting um, just more information as far as what the AQI is in relation to where the, the prescribed fire is happening. Um, you know, and I think we, we've talked about it a little bit, but you know, not to make statistical assumptions, we probably would want to look into some kind of research group to, to help us come up with uh, you know protocol for that um, but also thinking of ways we can you know look at 
um, the way the smoke impacts the community and, and what the situation is. So like if you have really hot, warm days um, and you are getting text alerts about smoke, is that, you know, is there a, is there a mitigation plan that we can provide for, for communities that might not have that option to, to have use air conditioning or, or ventilation and things like that, so. Well, uh, you know, getting the word out that uh, smoke in the spring and the fall from prescribed burn is something we need to understand and manage, but we should celebrate it also. You know, that's a prescribed burn. That's going to reduce the, the uncontrolled wildfire events that uh, happen at other times of the year. So, and, we, and we've got that message out over the years. So it's pretty exciting, you know, and the Central Oregon generally understands that. There's always new people coming to town and, uh, you know, different events happening. So it's uh, something we're going to keep our eye on the, constantly. So I see that we had three meetings uh, regarding the 50-acre burn si size. Has that limit been adjusted, or, are we st or is it still um, per DQ's standard 50 acres? Because that seems really small. Sarah and I were, were, were both part of those meetings. It, it, um, right, most of that. them happened just before Kevin got here. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, I, I you know, I, I know you. I think you're up to speed on 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 some of those discussions. But I I could provide a little bit of comment. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure on um, what has what decision has been made on the 50 acre burn, burn size. I know, um, you know, the the U.S. Forest Service would really like to increase their pace and scale, especially in the West Bend project area. Um, right now, I think prior to last year, they're, they're averaging roughly 300 acres per season, um, and they really want to get to 1,500 acres per season. Um, and that that was kind of thought out. If you think of a, a fire return interval in dry ponderosa pine forest, it's roughly um, you know five to 15 years. And so to keep up with that pace and scale is how they've come up with trying to accomplish 1,500 acres. But I, I, I can't comment on the 50 acres. I don't have enough information. And just based on, I mean, based on the, the weather and climate and wind conditions and, and fuels conditions we have here, um, getting, getting significant burning done in the West Bend uh, project area uh, is almost impossible without having, without having a, an air quality exceedance. Um, so we're, we're uh, we are seeking essentially flexibility from uh, DEQ and the Oregon Department of Forestry to uh, implement these you know community saving prescribed fire activities, um, uh, but you know to to have a, a little bit more smoke in the air than is than is desirable um, for confined periods of time. And uh, it, it is looking like uh, those those two agencies and the EPA are going to be, you know, they're going to they're going to be willing to work with us in this coming um, prescribed fire season um, to a achieve a, a larger amount of acreage in that West Bend project area. Um, but in the long run, uh, essentially, the the way that uh, the way that the state interprets the Clean Water, Clean Air Act rules, um, it, it's almost impossible for us to achieve the scale of prescribed burning uh, close into Bend without having um, uh, exceedances. Um, so that's the, so the long long term. You know, one of the things I'm going to be talking with Senator our, our two senators about um, when I go to D.C. is getting some kind of a special pilot or um, you know, uh, you know, a, a unique case, um, uh, a, you know, legislative, um, a, a legislative pilot to be able to do what we need to do here, uh, because uh, you know, even though even those uh, agencies that whose job it is to uh, protect public health from air quality impacts, they they get it that you know, not protecting people from high severity wildfire arriving at the edge of the city of Bend. Uh, is a greater impact to public health, um, and they also understood. You know, one of the things we, one of the things that came up in that discussion was, you know, if the fire gets into the city of Bend, and houses are burning and buildings are burning, um, the the toxicity of the smoke from, you know, paint and you know all sorts of other things that uh, would be burning, you know, roofing materials. Um, 
it makes the toxicity of the smoke far worse than just uh, burning wood um, and, and needles. So, so they, they, they get it, their, their hands are somewhat tied by the Clean Air Act. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to, um, you know, how, how to get the, uh, the exception that we need to do the work we need to do. But in the meantime, I know some people brought in some goats into Deschutes County and they were doing cleanup and the University of California at Davis had a study where actually running cows was really um, incredibly helpful. I, I know it's not quite the fire, but it still, you know, cleans up the underbrush. So then when the fire is, if it gets started, it's not um, incinerating quite like um, without that brush there. So it does make a difference. It can help with certain kinds of vegetation, but when you need to get rid of dead pine needles and, and a bunch of branches on the ground, the goats are, goats like to eat a lot of stuff, but <laughs> there's, well, there's still that. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, as I say, there's a couple, we've been doing this for a few years now, and uh, hopefully there'll be a little bit more prescribed fire uh, opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. If you see any goats running around there, let me know. <laughs> and the next item is the uh, SRS uh, Title III certification. Yeah. So, um, again, uh, for the record, Kevin Moriarty, County Forester. Um, for this item, uh, I am seeking approval for a chair signature to submit the Title III certification form. Um, and again, this is funding that we get um, through the Secure Rural Schools and Community uh, Self-Determination Act of 2000. Um, we generally have allocated funding, if you see on the second page, um, to, the to the three uh, or four areas of criteria. Um, the, the three that we uh, use the funding for is the uh, search and rescue funding um, that the county sheriff's uh, department uses and then through the natural resources department we utilize the funding for uh, for our salaries essentially uh, to work with firewise communities and to work on uh, uh, the CWPPs and so that money has been I think uh, allocated already it's a hundred and twenty thousand uh, sixty thousand went towards uh, search and rescue efforts and then the additional money went to help fund the salaries of myself and Corinne. Um, again, this is this was a calendar year uh, 2022. Um, so it's a, a, a little different because we work on a fiscal year that ends in June and starts in July. But um, I think it's been tracked in years past to just track the the work that we do on e with either Firewise Communities or CWPPs. Do you have any questions? I would just say these are extremely important and welcome funds that allow us to do work that our, you know, our community desperately needs us to do. Um, you know, so, I, and I have no concerns about either the, the, this, re this report or um, about the way that we're distributing the funds uh, between the, the sheriff's office and, and the county forester's office. Um, I'm, uh, you may or may not uh, have an answer to this, but uh, I am concerned about um, the stability of this funding in the long term. Uh, I, I, I know that the Secure Rural Schools program you know, basically, you know, Congress every couple of years, you know, and Senator Wyden plays a really central role in this. They just, you know, find some vehicle to, to attach, you know, a, a, a reauthorization of secure rural schools to every couple of years. Um, and I actually don't know um, this most recent re-upping what the, what the mechanism for that was or, you know, what, what I, I, it, maybe it was attached to the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure law, um, uh, but I, I would love to know, you know, a how did we how did we um, reauthorize secure rural schools this time, and b how many years do we get this for? Um, yeah, just to, you know, so that we can be looking out towards the future and making sure that these really important functions um, are are adequately funded, uh, you know, moving forward. 
yeah, I, I don't have a lot of information on that. I do know um, with some of the notes that Ed Key that had left that the, these, this funding has been decreasing over the last few years and probably will continue to decrease, so. Right, right. Well, so if you could, um, maybe you could make that a, 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 a like get back to me later. Um, uh, like uh, do a do a little research on that. It would yeah. be, it would be helpful to just understand, and it, it's quite possible that AOC, um, the that um, people at AOC have this information at their fingertips. But I I just don't have it at my fingertips. So I I just like to n have some predictability around these funds so that um, you know we know when we need to start worrying about. Finding replacement dollars, if um, you know, if if, uh, if that's soon. Okay, yeah, I can follow you up with you on that, Commissioner Chang. So this certification is due today. Correct. Yeah, like okay, what if something would happen and we couldn't have the meeting today? Um, yeah, okay, just seems scary that we almost missed our deadline. It hasn't. We didn't have a county forester for a good handful of months, so. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I know, and I'm sure that our Zoom is going to work much better at our next meeting, isn't it? <laughs> Whitney has promised us. <clears throat> yes. Is there a motion? So moved. Chair signature of document number 2023-136-2022 Title Three certification form. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Commissioner Dare? Yes. Commissioner Chang? Yes. And Chair Both, yes. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Okay, thank you. That Sorry, we slipped a few hours today. I have a phone call with uh, Amelia Porterfield in 10 minutes from the Governor's Regional Solutions Office, so I'm just acknowledging I'd like to work around that somehow. <coughs> Looks like you yes, have Thank something. you, Chair. I was just going to suggest that if perhaps we could reconvene after your call at some point, 2.30 or something of that nature. Um, Commissioner Chang will be gone next week, so um, yeah, so to address the grants, we could still do it's that. It's only going to be 15 or 20 minutes, so. Okay, whatever time works for you. And then we have a, a couple of, I think, relatively brief property items to discuss in, a, yeah. in an executive session. So um, whatever time works for the board. So maybe 2 o'clock. I scheduled another meeting at 3. Yeah, so maybe between 2 and 3, so we can we knock out a bunch of Squeeze whatever we need. 2 and 250 or whatever. Does that work for you, Commissioner? Dan? Yeah, I didn't want to have a lunch. Oh, I, I want to have a lunch, and it's going to be. Okay, so yeah, we're going to take a break till 2 o'clock.
from a break here. It's uh, <clears throat> February 1st at 2 in the afternoon, but we're going to get to our last agenda item. Uh, item number 10, quarter three discretionary grant review. All right, good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, Stephanie Robinson, Administrative Services. I'm here to present the application submitted to the Deschutes County Discretionary Grant Program for activities that will take place beginning or about the third quarter of 2022-2023. Each quarter, the commissioners review applications submitted to the Deschutes County Discretionary Grant Program and makes awards accordingly. Do you have any questions before we begin? Sort of two high-level questions. Um, one, I think that a couple of these entities received ARPA allocations, and I, I didn't see that in the kind of uh, you know grants awarded in the last five years information. So, uh, to the extent that you know about um, uh, our ARPA awards, if you could if you could share those with us, Stephanie, uh, like as we as we go through. Um, and uh, yeah, my my other question was there are a whole lot of entities who uh, typically uh, who regularly come in for arts and culture requests in this pool um, and I I know that we have made um, grants to some of those entities out of the discretionary program in the past uh, but I I also just kind of wanted to ask whether um, you know whether whether we want to have a silo for arts and culture stuff or we don't want to have a silo for arts and culture stuff because uh, um, if if all of the arts and culture grantees are coming into the discretionary grant program as well um, it could it could you know it could it could consume a lot of the resources that are available and uh, you know in some ways I'd rather us just try to separately make the arts and culture pool bigger and serve those sewer, serve those entities there um, but I, you know the, I was just surprised at how many of the how many of the applications we received this this round were arts and culture type ap applications or art, arts arts and culture groups I mean in some cases they were it seemed like in a lot of cases they were asking for like a piece of equipment or like a capital expenditure which I know is separate than you know providing a specific arts and culture program well and, and I I really like it when we do arts and culture you know this is it's one of those attributes of community and society which is exciting and positive and welcoming for everybody so yeah I mean it's always a good thing to be involved in I think of our spreadsheet annually. We say, okay, well, let's kind of allocate uh, video lo lottery dollars like this. And one of those line items is uh, arts and culture. Um, and we do just that once a year, right? I mean, I think we, did, we already did it for this fiscal year. And it's coming up again in April, of April 2023 for F. The spreadsheet, but not an arts and culture grant oh, process. No. Um, that's January. Did arts and culture grants? Or they yeah, I think we remember that. Yeah, we just completed them. Yeah, I'm thinking we just completed them, but it must have been November, December, or something. I don't know. It was in the end of the year. But uh, my point, if we say, if we, you know, we say, well, th thank you. We think this is more arts and culture. It could be majority of a year before we get around to that, unless we just make a special allocation. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to. I, I mean, we can we can do it either way. I like it. Uh, it, it just in some ways it would be uh, it would be nice to compartmentalize the arts and culture groups, even if that meant you know if we want to be granting some of these requests, then maybe we just create a like a, another category within that program for people to come in with equipment and. And uh, you know, facility type type uh, requests as well as for, for programs. Um. 
Well, so another high level thought is uh, I would like to maybe get real focused on an allocation from, you know, me as a commissioner and the, and the uh, numbers we have agreed upon here and do something influential towards stabilizing people in their houses and uh, uh, into housing, you know, referring to homeless issues or whatever. Um, you know, I'm at a point where I could see a bunch of little allocations going lots of different ways as, as a small little investment, but I'd almost like to do something a little bit you know, more impactful for our current situations, I guess. And I, I don't have a uh, complete thought on that, but I, I guess I'm saying these words in a public meeting so people that apply understand what, what I might do here for some of these also. <clears throat> so just thoughts to get started. Should we get started and then just yeah. kind of we can go back if needed? Okay. The first request is from Cascades Theatrical Company. They're requesting 2000 to support building renovation and restoration of the 101-year-old Cascades Theater. Some projects include replacing the HVAC system, upgrading the sprinkler system, installing a new roof and marquee, and refurbishing the theater seats. These projects are, are ongoing and are expected to be completed by December 2024. So uh, my first thought is there, I'd you know, maybe like to be a partner on that, but uh, maybe not at this time. You know, understanding the big picture, if we just throw $2,000 into the kitty for a $180,000 project, you know, I, I think we can stand by and maybe make a relationship and make sure this is a success, successful project. But yeah, so I'm in, I can stand by on that one. So they've raised like 95,000? Is that what their letter says? Mm -hmm. They've generated more than 50,000 and then they've <coughs> created additional funding of 45,000. So they're halfway there. And they're only asking for 2,000 from us. And the building is 101 years old. Mm -hmm. Like, hmm. I guess I'd say. Is there a historical fund somewhere that they can um, ask? Do we have any historical help in the community? There's a historical society. Right. I thought there was like maybe a $10,000 fund there or something. They don't have a big checkbook, though, I don't think. <laughs> um, I, I guess I would kind of continue my earlier thought. I'd like to encourage us to think about creating a facilities and equipment kind of pot with within the arts and culture grant program but um, you know just for the purposes of today I uh, please put me down for 500 I'm gonna go with zero but I want to make a relationship with them and advocate for their project so it's not like I'm not supportive it's just not at this time because I'm I mean I may be interested in doing more even I guess is the message so I can, I can do 500. All right, our next request is from City Club of Central Oregon. They're requesting $1,000 to support their February monthly forum titled Help Wanted, Developing Talent to Meet Community Needs. This forum will highlight new and creative employment strategies being deployed across the region to ensure our community has access to high quality services, including construction, healthcare, and trades. This is planned for February 16th at the River House in Bend. All the topics that the City Club is dealing with on an annual basis, I think that this is a uh, this is one of the good ones for our, uh, for the county to support, in my opinion. So, please put me down for five hundred. Uh, I'll do the difference to five hundred if maybe just two of us invest in this. I mean, I'm just. So you'll do five hundred? Yeah. So that I, w I don't have to do any. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. <coughs> All right, our next request is from Clear Alliance. They're requesting $2,250 to support a free on-site training of High Desert Education Service Districts driving instructor, 
instructors in an impaired driving education course. Trained instructors will educate youth in Central Oregon about the risks of impaired driving, sharing facts on impaired driving from alcohol as well as, well as other substances. Grant dollars will support the ongoing activity of bringing awareness of impaired driving to youth in Central Oregon. I'll do 2000. You're doing two? Mm -hmm. Oh, good for you. What do you think with um, 200 more DUIs in Bend the last year? I know Redmond went down, but Bend went way up, so. Wow. And you can barely get a drink that's non-alcoholic if you order it at certain places, so. Since I had 30 days of no alcohol, I can t attest to trying to find drinks that are non-alcoholic. It's an extremely important goal, but uh, the, this group uh, <coughs> I continually want to see evidence um, for, you know, like evidence to support the, the kinds of programs that they do or evidence of the impact of the programs that they do. And um, I, I haven't seen it really yet, so I, I, I'm going to pass on this one. And I'll do the 250 then. This is working out interesting today. <laughs> Our next request, Council on Aging, is requesting $1,750 for a portable stage in their newly renovated dining hall space. The portable stage will be used for various special events, classes, and entertainment, and as well as for a multitude of activities during free senior lunches. The raised stage will complement the updated sound, screen, and lighting in the space. The portable stage will also ensure that all guests can hear and see the performances and presentations. Stephanie, is this one of the ones that we've made an ARPA allocation for? Yes, so I have um, all, all our ARPA or here in my notes, so I'll, yeah, I can share those with you. Um, we awarded them $327,000 yeah. <laughs> to finish their funding, and we've given them money almost every quarter. Uh, we've hardly missed a moment so yeah and, and we that 327,000 was for this building is, is that correct yes remodel of the senior services hub uh, so is there just want to stand by on this then well I, I'm not I don't have any allocated for here yeah it's a great organization doing incredibly important work, but like I, um, we just made a three hundred twenty-seven thousand dollar ARPA investment in that facility, and I, I, I feel like we're covered for, for yep. now. And yeah, I mean, when there's you know, foundational things, I'm happy to provide, but the stage will pass on at this time. The next request is from Embers Wildflower Animal Sanctuary and Bunny Rescue. They're requesting $1,500 to update their website. The newer website will help Embers get more exposure in the local and surrounding communities and will be a better communication platform. The funds would cover the website designer fees and board members will be trained to make updates, keeping ongoing maintenance costs low. I'm not gonna invest in this one at this time. Like to, I'd like to support this organization through the spay and neuter grant program. Did we do anything through spay and neuter for these people? Yes. Um, last year. 2032 yeah, and 22 and right there, 1580. Oh, we did last year. So, yeah, they should apply to that again. <clears throat> when, when is the spay and neuter cycle? That is coming up. And payments, the awards are made in June. Mm -hmm. so, sometime this spring. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, the next request is from Hunger Prevention Coalition of Central Oregon. They're requesting $2,000 to support their Help Fill Empty Plates program. 
The program uses donated funds to purchase fresh fruit, vegetables, and protein, which is distributed via numerous food pantry and meal site program partners across Deschutes County. The COVID pandemic, along with current inflation, has combined to create increasing challenges for the homeless and hungry in Deschutes County. There is also the increased need for fresh, healthy food for all ages and demographics. So my thought there is I'd like to, you know, maybe work with our joint office and figure out where, you know, where some good strategic investments are. Because, I mean, it's a great story and fresh food is very important and food supply. Uh, and calories and for people in need, but I'm um, hesitant to just disperse funding in different directions at this time without more of a vision at this in the near future. I would say this is a this is a long standing community program campaign. Um, I, I see the signs every year at the grocery store and and um, seems to be impactful to me so I'll, uh, please put me down for 750 for how much 750 I know they have been around since what 2007 is their IRS uh, ruling so but does it say how much they gave this last year says in fiscal year 21 quarter three we gave them seven hundred dollars no I know but I meant how much how much food did they produce yeah how much food did they give out that's I mean I'm just it would be really nice if they had like a historical perspective since they've been around so long at least like okay we gave out 2,000 pounds you know in 2007 I don't know how they're measuring it but um, I'll do I'll do two fifty, two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay. That that would be that would be valuable information. So maybe you wouldn't we share that with them. Ask ask mm -hmm. them to kind of give us a sense of their their impact. All right, the next request is from Jericho Road. They're requesting $3,000 to support, support their food programs, which include Jericho Table, Weekend Student Food Packs, Emergency Assistance, and Homeless Camp Outreach. These programs have assisted thousands of participants in staying fed with healthy meals. These food programs are designed to help the homeless and hungry in Deschutes County to include the working poor and people of all ages and backgrounds. in my mind another well-established program that's having impact and um, please put me down for a thousand so we did their fundraiser in 22 are they doing a fundraiser again if it's possible that they could actually apply for a fundraiser that might be um, appropriate gotten a request from them yet for the fundraising but I could ask if they okay that event this year. If we did 1200 for, if they're aiming for golf it will probably be next quarter right <laughs> and I'm not gonna do anything on that one either. All right, our next request is from the Deschutes chapter of Sleep in Heavenly Peace. They're requesting $2,781.40 in grant support to build and distribute 10 beds to children in the community. The organization delivers fully furnished twin beds to local children who sleep on floors, couches, and other inadequate situations without having the luxury of a bed. This chapter has built and delivered 525 beds throughout the service area since 2020 and plans to provide at least 300 more each year 
to local area bedless children. And we, um, the board awarded an ARPA grant of $5,000 recently for the, to this organization. Do you know what date it was? Was it 22 then sometime? Was it last fall? Yeah, November, December. I think I saw the payment in Munis around then. I know they did a, a phenomenal job. They brought together <coughs> four rotaries, clubs, a bend, and they were all building beds one Saturday when I was there. So um, Dave Givens was even there helping. He's the president of one of the rotaries. So um, anyway, it was really wonderful. I'll, I'll, I'll do 2000 again because it, their need seems to be um, ever growing. Got nothing for me on that one. Remind us of the ARPA allocation we made for sleeping. Everybody. It was five thousand um, dollars, which was essentially for twenty beds. This is about half that for ten beds. Um, put me down for uh, five hundred. Thanks. Thanks. So that's close to what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Sun River Stars Community Theater is requesting $600 for the purchase of a new LED spotlight for their theater. The existing spotlight is hot and more floodlight than spudlight. While well, the new LED spotlight will be cool to the touch and more efficient. The new spotlight will give the theater more capabilities to enhance the quality of their performances. I'll be supportive of this one. Just, just it's a good amount. It's a tangible thing for me, and I, you know, I've, I've been to some performances there. So you're doing the 600? Uh, yeah. I mean, maybe we'll leave it at that. I'll do that. Oh, yeah. sure. I think you okay. should. There you go. I, I was trying not to do the whole thing, but pressure. I don't mind it. You don't mind it. I, I would chip in for that one, but if you're going to cover it, yeah, just for how I'm spending money today, that's fine. All right, the Tower Theater Foundation is requesting $1,910 to implement sensory-friendly programming. The theater's goal is to improve inclusion for families whose children are on the autistic spectrum or have intellectual or developmental disabilities in theater programming. The funds would be used to develop sensory programming and sensory-friendly events through a staff training, a weighted lap pad, sensory bags, and signage. So Commissioner Chang, I, I kind of agree that, yeah, maybe there's a, a discretionary arts and culture, something different than our bigger effort. You know, maybe there's a different way to do some of that. But, but I don't mind, you know, yeah, we're, we're funding some of this right now. Yeah, too. But we haven't made that decision yeah. yet, so yeah. for today. Um, I, you know. I'm supportive of a third or. Yeah. Put me down for 500. Put me down for 600. And I'll do zero. All right, our last request is a fundraiser request. The Sun River Women's Club is requesting $2,500 to support this August Sun River Art Fair. The Art Fair is an all volunteer produced event supported by local sponsors, artists from across the county, and community donations. Grant funds would be used for marketing and publicity campaigns for the event, as well as provide a secure temporary Wi-Fi network during the <coughs> sales transactions. Revenue from the art fair will support food insecurity, child abuse prevention, and youth development programs in Southern Deschutes County. So uh, we show $500 balance on fundraising requests for the year. We do have a history of supporting this at that level that they've been asking. Can we can we transfer some funding? The $2,000 over. And then we might have somebody asking in the new, next quarter too. Right, but I mean, if at least we cover this one, because it is South County. I'm thinking like, how what things here are going to South County? So yeah, you support transferring from other reserves to 
complete that amount? Yeah, that's what we'll do then. Would anyone like to go back and make any changes or adjustments? <sighs> nope. I think we're good. Good. Right, perfect. Thank you. I think okay. Okay, we got through that. That's a quarterly. Uh, we'll have uh, one more allocation with these funds uh, before the end of the year. Uh, and at this time, other items, or we'll get into an executive session also. And, uh, any other items, Commissioner? Nope. Uh, well, I. So yeah, what are you? What are you? When are you traveling? Today's the first. Next Wednesday or Thursday? On Wednesday. This week? Uh, no. Next. Today is Wednesday. Week. Yeah. Wednesday morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next Wednesday. Okay. Yep. I uh, I will be out tomorrow um, for my birthday, and then um, that's well, not, we should sing. It's not tomorrow, <laughs> uh, so you don't have to sing. Maybe you should <laughs> sing. Uh, Choose who sings. I'll be out tomorrow uh, after our legislative meeting, um, which I'll attend virtually. But then Friday. Out the rest of the day. Oh, sorry, Friday. Yeah. I was I going like, Friday. is that tomorrow? I'll be out on Friday. Um, and then on Monday, I'll be at the AOC um, legislative meeting uh, virtually. That's, yeah, okay. And then, yeah, and then by Wednesday, I'll, Wednesday morning, I'll be, early Wednesday morning, I'll be leaving. Yep, understood, okay. Well, hopefully there'll be a TIC in the machine <coughs> available. Mm -hmm. So you can leave early. Here in Denver, maybe. Uh, any other items, Commissioner? Um, I'm going out to China Hut tomorrow with um, Deputy Blaylock, and we've inv we're inviting Cheyenne to go with us. Great. Okay. So, and apparently Kevin is going to meet with the party that had the bullets going by her head, Kevin Larkin. So, anyway, okay, doing what we can. I'll be attending the first COIC board meeting tomorrow night, so that's coming around. Uh, and then also, I just want the other commissioners to understand, I'm going to offer to host the Land Use Leadership Institute, which is a uh, thousand friends of Oregon and Central Oregon Land Watch, which I'm participating in, uh, in this room on the third of April, so a couple months from now. But it's just a kind of a, a building room use uh, that just letting you know, make sure there's no resistance or response to that. Or um, and we, you know, we did that with the uh, the the kids um, uh, congressional hearing mock mock hearing also so we do this once in a while and uh, you know if there's ever any reason we should uh, you know have more policy about who uses the room when was, we can talk about that but April 3rd I'll be hosting the Luli here so that's a Monday I mean I, I think in the in the big bigger picture we do want to think about you know offering our facilities after hours uh, to, to groups because it, it does have, um, it can have a, a like a, a, a staff a cost impact. You know, if, if yeah, your staff right. that has to like stay here to keep it open or, or um, you know, run AV equipment or anything like that. Um, so, I mean, it's not a problem yet, but it, I mean, you know, if we, if we really, if we really made this like a, hey, this is a public venue that people can use, like it, it could, it could add up to a, a significant impact. Yeah, so as I say, I, I was able to host and uh, bring the Trinity Lutheran kids in, and then also I'm part of this one, so, you know, we'll be using the room again. But, yeah, if we ever had a third party wanting to use the room late in the evening, you don't staffing need, would be the... For Lily, you don't need... Um, no, nope, it's just a sitting in the room. Yeah. Running, running. Oh, well, yeah, they might want to do a Zoom something. I don't know. I didn't get that far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah those are that. Yeah, they didn't ask. The kinds, yeah. Those are the yeah. kinds of staff costs, yep. right? great if you can kind of open the doors and clean up. Yeah, I was just thinking, we, when we're meeting in person, we didn't have a remote part of it. So. But yeah, so the, uh, that was a discussion that, yeah, if we want to put a little bit more structure, mm -hmm. Commissioner Dare, do you have thoughts about that for, you know, either there's a, you know, a fee or a cost right. of, of using this room or, or? Well, there should be a fee. 
yeah. you know, I don't know what it would be, $200, 250 something to cover our costs. Have we had a, anything kind of defined better in the past that you know of, Nick? I haven't really thought about that ever. Not that I'm aware of. Because people just use it once in a while, and right. sometimes they're not direct county operations, but it's really never been an issue. Right. During elections, we often will see it with uh, League of yeah. Women Voters, but that's about it that I'm aware of that aren't county uh, specific meetings or events yeah and I don't know it's just never become a place where a lot of people ask but maybe there was a history where we used to tell them no or I don't know I don't have a feel for it yeah. okay well we'll take it forward from here yeah I, I mean I, yeah I, I thinking about what an, what would be an appropriate fee like wh mm -hmm. what you know what costs we have associated with just just the building wear and tear and cleaning and you know if there's a, a need for IT support or someone to open the door and close the door and all that stuff you know, it, it'd be good to have a feel for what it costs us okay that's good that's good direction yeah let's make an estimate we can go from there yep okay I think that's the only other items I had well, we did have our COVA meeting last night and they did go over the financial statements which were reviewed this year they had been audited the prior year and um, yes of course financially they have um, increased their cash flow position which is good and they are seeing the numbers have been going down um, October and November's numbers have been have decreased in so revenue. visitors association right mm -hmm. so um, yes and she's doing some new marketing she lost a couple employees like kind of back to back but it seems like she's got it all under control the hearing for HB 2101 yesterday. Mm. Oh yeah, last night? Sound How'd that go? Seemed to go well. Okay. I mean, I, I, uh, I, had only, I only had till 6.30 and then I had, I was sitting and watching until about 6.10. I gave my testimony. Oh good, and, and yeah, before it went, okay. So the, yeah, that'll be an interesting dynamic because you know, the sounds like the ODOT itself was like, nope, gotta do this and uh, you know, our county partners, everybody saying, no, wait a minute. So the legislature's really going to have to make a call on this one. Yeah. And Mr. Doty is usually incredibly positive, and he's saying we have to take a stand. Yeah. It's time for a stand. Nick, any other items? Yeah, thank you, too. Um, one, just staying on the legislative theme for just a moment, uh, our lobbyist, Doug Riggs, just sent me a message a couple of moments ago asking for our top ballpark five issues that we would like to raise with legislators on uh, Friday morning, mm -hmm. um, our first meeting. And I know the commissioners, we haven't been able to get all through all, all of your priorities, all the bills, et cetera, yet. But I can, uh, of course, identify some right off the top, you know, rural accessory dwelling units and what that looks like uh, possibly would be one. Courthouse expansion could be another. Um, we just mentioned 2101. Uh, there's there's so many topics we could i don't know if the board is interested in you know raising something with measure 110 or do you want more information on the governor's budget or what their response is to the governor's budget so those are just some things to think about if you have ideas um it'd be great to really crystallize mm -hmm. those five so we can give them tomorrow so for the bill list uh i'm i need to see it on paper just to visualize uh so either a spreadsheet or access to you know, bill tracker or whatever we're doing. So, you know, it's like, because all the, I know all the topics, but I'm not associating with bill numbers yet. So when people start throwing a number around, I'm like, ah, I don't even know. But, you know, I just know for, for me, once I see a, you know, a, an explanation next to the number and I can envision which spreadsheet I was saw it at, then I can start associating numbers. So, um, yeah, I'd like to, whatever that looks like. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we can do that for sure. And he just said either a bill number or just a yeah. topic. Is well, I'm just thinking, there, yeah, so we can start the yeah. lingo. Uh, yeah, accessory dwelling units, just to make sure, you know, that's our, our ask. Uh, and I don't know, you know, learning if other people are, you know, in the same spot as Deschutes County, where, you know, if we could separate these things, even though we're committed to, uh, you know, whatever level of uh, development we need. So, yeah, I'm just saying that one for sure. I, I mean, at the high level, you know, there's rumblings about a behavioral health investment package. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really interested in that. Um, you know, there's rumblings about uh, investments in, in homeless uh, 
services and facilities. Really interested in that. Yeah, also really interested in what uh, you know what the state can do to. And you know, the governor has been talking a lot about um, trying to help. Um, uh, uh, you know, help help make state public investments in housing as well. So those three things: housing, homelessness, behavioral health. Show me the money. Oh, and then infrastructure, you know, I, uh, you know, we always talk about roads, water, and sewer, but uh, I know that there has been some investments in the past, and I think there's like a rural infrastructure bill or a, a city infrastructure bill or something it was talked about. So that'd be interesting to know if, the, you know, if there's any piece of the pie that could ca go, you know, cash to people that need infrastructure offsets. Thank you. Commissioner Adair, any? I noticed that she's going to divert $765 million um, out of the re not to be added to the reserve. So, of course, the budget's going up, uh, you know, another 10%. And uh, is that really sustainable? So something to look at. Um, what was it? Oregon was, was one of the, count uh, the states that went down in population. And um, we need to kind of be aware of that and she's cutting less um, money for business services and Oregon has a reputation of not being particularly business friendly so I think maybe if we can support businesses I think that's important thank you I'll pass those on to uh, along those lines the uh, enterprise zone bill I think is serious for our EDCO ready efforts in Central Oregon Back, Commissioner Chang, I, uh, I had a committee on my uh, schedule for Reddy's legislative committee uh, yesterday, and that got me to think that I'd probably like to just be involved with one of the subcommittees of the Reddy effort. If you're going to the Reddy board meetings, I'll go to one of the sub meetings. Uh, it's just some of the committee work that they do. One of them is the legislative committee. They also have like strategic planning and probably an executive committee, but legislative would be the place to plug in right now for me because. That, you know, then I'm hearing what everybody's talking about for the legislative session. Okay, yeah, I, I have not gotten plugged in enough to even know that Ready had subcommittee. Yeah. Well, and yeah, obviously, legislative is comes and goes, but right now they had a meeting and I didn't attend yesterday, but they sent me an email of what they were talking about, which was that bill. So. Oh, and I did go to the Redmond Chamber event, which was held for the first time at the fairgrounds. Um, it was incredibly well attended. They had um, Blue Bite was the caterer, and it, they did a great job. And they said they wanted to come back. What event was that? A the chamber coffee annual. Platter no, no, the oh, annual, annual dinner, oh, yeah. annual dinner yeah, honoring yeah. their um, award recipients. So yes. it was really, um, it was excellent. Great to have it at the fairgrounds, and I know it'll even be better next year. I don't think we missed one in ten years, and this one just didn't fit our schedule. It's okay. You were there for the commission, though, right? I was there. Good. Yeah, it was great. Okay. Nick, can I ask uh, which legislators are coming? I, I don't know that yet. Um, I can I will confirm did, with the. Did Whitney say there's two coming? That's what he, I think he had confirmed as of yesterday, I believe, but I will confirm. And then the only other item I have is just. Uh, uh, based on board direction and really significant public uh, interest, we issued the press release today announcing the two vacancies on the Planning Commission. So uh, today we, we are, are getting we, the press release is issued and we're inviting um, applications, applicants for uh, the at-large position and for the Tumalo position. So the positions open today, February 1st, and it closes on uh, the last day of the month, Tuesday, February 28th at 4 p.m. Thank you. Great. Pretty exciting. Okay. Anything else in the regular session? Uh, seeing nothing, we're going to go to an executive session uh, regarding land use. Is this 